So I would like to uh, welcome everyone here to this second workshop, Energy Materials for Innovation. I am Carl Fredrik Nilsson. I am from the GRC. And uh, I, my, so I, I am the uh, chairman of this, uh, of this workshop here. And my co-host here today is, um, is Sake. And could you present yourself a little bit, Sake? Yes, of course. Hi, Sako, my name oh, is Sako. Sorry, Sako, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Sako Nakami. I am from uh, Atomic Energy and Alternative Energies Commission of France. And uh, to, this is the second workshop of the workshop series called Energy Materials for Innovation, which is the initiative of EERA. And at its organization core uh, is, organ, uh, is by three joint programs of EERA. The first one being Nuclear Materials, coordinator being the Lorenzo Malerba from CMAT. And then the Digital for Energy Transversal Joint Program with a coordinator of May, Rafael Mayo Garcia, also from CMAT, both of them present here. And the third joint program is AMPIA, Advanced Materials and Processes for Energy Applications, which is coordinated by myself and Dr. Monica Fabrizio from CNR. So the first workshop took place three months ago, also online on materials discovery and development. And this second workshop is from Lab to Engineering. And in total, we're expecting to have six online workshops, which tackles the every stage of the material research and development. So the goal of the workshop series is to bring the material research science to the front line of the research uh, landscape of Europe and how we, in, by treating the cross-cutting issues and challenges and methodologies in all stages of material science development so that we can identify the common strategy to accelerate material science development for the international and global and European goal of net zero 2050 um, objective. So the second one, of course, is the organization chair is Kelly from GRC and also member of New Nuclear Materials. And today we have five speakers who are all in the, who have or in one way or another succeeded in bringing academic research or material science in closer to the commercialization market and industrialization. So with that, I give back my, um, the stage to Kelly, who would uh, go over the structure of the workshop and how it's going to be done for the next two days. Uh, thank you, <coughs> Sako. So <coughs> the, the, the way we have organized this now, so we have, it's, you see it's a two day event or two half days. So we have selected um, experts in different fields that will make these presentations. I think it's, so we are actually, we are also looking at seeing, is there any cross-cutting? What are the common factors for, for this very important step of bringing the research to the products? We talk about it all the time about innovation. And this, it's, this, this is a stage where Europe is maybe a little bit weaker. In Europe, we are very good developing things, but bring it into the products. So we will have a number of, of this today. We have five very interesting presentations. At the end of this day, Holger Eason, he will make a summary of our today's funding. Tomorrow afternoon, we will have uh, four presentations. And in the end, at the end of tomorrow, we will have a, um, a panel. So there are four of the presenters that are in the panel and they will, they will, <coughs> they will um, be asked to address uh, questions about what are the factors that uh, make this to be successful to taking this step from the R&D to products. What are the bottlenecks for reaching this stage? And then also what can be done to, uh, to mitigate these bottle, bottlenecks and promote what is the, uh, the good examples for it. 
in terms of the policies from, for instance, the European Commission or the member states. And so we will see, and then we would, and then we would also like to see to what extent uh, there is transferability, meaning that are the problems or issues, are they common across the different technologies? So we are, uh, so we are now, um, let's see, so we will start here with, the, with this, uh, and, and, and also now important, so we will have, so all the speakers are given half an hour in total, and that includes a short introduction of the speaker, and then uh, uh, some question at the end. So we have asked the, quest the uh, presenters to try to limit their presentation to 20 minutes. When we come close to the end, and I will inform you uh, five minutes before that now you have to come to the conclusions. And, uh, and then since we are there are about 100 uh, registrants for this workshop, we will see how many that will actually be here, but it's qu quite a large number. So uh, you are uh, asked to provide your questions in the chat and then write write to and, and then so write your question and write to to which presenter the question is because so we can keep track of that afterwards and then and Sarko will then look at the questions and depending on the time we will sec select the questions to um, for, for the discussion here and within the time slot for the presenters and for the presenters in case that all the questions cannot be addressed. We ask you to, in the chat, uh, reply to the to the persons asking these questions. So I think now we are uh, slightly ahead of the time, but given that the, our first presenter, she will Alice Hoffman, she will have to to leave. So I actually suggest that we we start now. So our first uh, presentation is uh, it's uh, entitled Structured LEB Electrodes from Con Concept to Production Process. It's presented by Alice Hoffman, who comes from uh, Centrum für Sonnenenergie in uh, und Wasserstoff Forschung Baden-Württemberg in Germany, Ulm. And she is the head of this uh, <coughs> of, of, the, of the team process technology within the Department of Accumulators Materials Research. Uh, after she had established pilot lines for manufacturing of lithium ion cells in the form of pouch and 18650, she's responsible for projects of research and development concerning lithium ion electrodes and the manufacturing process and prototyping of uh, lithium ion fuel cells and she holds a PhD in uh, physical chemistry. So Alice, please, uh, you can start your presentation. Can you see my presentation now? Yes. Okay, so good afternoon everybody and welcome to my presentation about structuring concepts for innovative electrodes for lithium ion batteries. Um, my name is Alice Hoffmann and I'm from the German Institute ZSW. Within the next years, a huge increase of global demand for lithium ion batteries is expected which will be dominated by high energy applications. And one approach to implement high energy density on electrode level is to make the composites ultra thick. In common lithium ion batteries, the electrochemical active composites have a thickness of roughly 60 micrometers and a considerable share of the electrode stack consists of passive material like uh, current collectors or separators. By laying out the composites ultra thick, the share of active material increases and so does energy density. However, 
Besides mechanical impairments that you can see here, the adhesive strength decreases with aerial capacities and ultra-thick electrodes have a tendency to build cracks. The ultra-thick electrodes show very uh, low power, which is currently the greatest obstacle for their use in high energy applications. The reason is their limited lithium ion diffusion kinetics. One strategy to counteract this limitation is to locally customize the microstructure to enable a fast utilization of more active material. And here and after, I will show some structuring concepts that are suitable. The first concept is a graded arrangement of active materials. Usually, smaller particles show faster kinetics than large ones. As an example, you see here the 5C um, rate capability. The 5C discharge capacity of a high voltage spinel is more than 50% higher for small particle sizes compared to large ones. And this could suggest to increase the power of thick electrodes by building them up only with very small particles. However, the crack free thickness of electrodes is limited by particle size, which is here R in, in red. So that is especially the construction of very thick composites with very small particles is unfavorable from the point of view of mechanical properties. So a method to make use of smaller particles and their advantages in ultra thick electrodes is to place them targeted in only one of two moderately thick layers forming the overall composite. The approach of two layer coating is supported by results from simulation, considering a graded arrangement of porosity and active material particle size within the composite. In this study, we see an increase of rate capa of uh, capacity at 2 milliampere per square centimeter of nearly 40%, however, on the cost of capacity. There is another study considering um, charge and discharge at low rate and at higher rate where a 25% increase of current of capacity is predicted for the higher C rate without loss of at low C rate. So although the simulations are confined to the regarded systems and they conclude different trends for an optimal structure, they predict large improvement by a graded arrangement compared to homogeneous single layer arrangement. A large increase of aerial or volumetric capacity at higher current density is predicted, which can be reached with or without compromises at low current densities. In practice, the graded arrangement can be realized by a successive coating of two distinct suspensions. After the first layer is coated and dried, the composite can by choice be intermediately calendered. Or the second layer is coated directly on the first one. By the final calendaring, the two layer composite is densified as a whole. Here I show experimental results that we gained from ultra thick NCM622 cathodes produced by successive two-layer coating. The suspensions differed in NCM particle size. All electrodes in this study were produced with the same aerial capacity as high as 8 mAh per square centimeter and the same overall density. And as you can see, the single layer, in a single layer arrangement, the applied material samples do not show a considerable influence of particle size on rate capability. However, in a two layer arrangement, the applied material, uh, we observe a large decrease or increase of material utilization and thus power density, depending on the order of layers. 
with the large particles near the current collector and the small particles near the separator shown in green. The energy density of the electrode is increased by 20% at a discharge rate of 1C without a loss at low current density. But there are also some issues associated with the successive two-layer coating. By combination of experiments and simulation, it was found that the volume fraction of active material particles can be reduced at the interface between the two layers, probably especially in the case of intermediate calendaring, and that this can lead to an increased resistivity. Furthermore, the method implies two runs of coating and drying and the graded arrangement of porosity can usually only be realized for the case of higher density near the current collector and not vice versa. Nevertheless, the successive two-layer coating enables a customized vertical arrangement of active materials. It does not necessarily demand additional equipment and further processing steps like assembly time are not affected. And as it was shown, a significant increase of power without loss of energy density can be reached. The next concept I want to show is a locally customized passive material structure reached by simultaneous two-layer slot die coating. In the electrode composite, the distribution of passive material designated as carbon binder domain has a strong impact on the kinetics. Simulation combined with experiments suggested an optimal CBD configuration for high power in ultra thick cathodes. It consists of a high proportion of CBD close to the current collector and a lower proportion close to the separator. Compared to other CBD structures for this configuration, less lithium depletion and a higher active material utilization and consequently an increased aerial capacity was predicted at a discharge rate of 1C. However, due to the common phenomenon of binder migration, which occurs during the drying process of electrode fabrication, this optical arrangement is opposite to the structure that is usually generated in practice. An approach to realize it, nevertheless, is a simultaneous two-layer coating, as I will explain on the following slide. Typically, when the solvent is evaporated, as shown here, for the drying process after a usual single-layer coating, it takes a long binder to the upper surface. This so-called binder migration is enhanced by high drying rates and leads to an impairment of adhesion and electrochemical performance. To counteract this arrangement, two different suspensions can be applied simultaneously with a, two, uh, with a double slot die on a collector foil. In the experiment I will show on the following slides, the lower layer contains a higher binder content than the upper layer. And um, in average, they have the same composition as a single layer electrode. In this case, during the drying process, a more homogeneous or even an opposite arrangement of the CBD can be reached. There are already results about simultaneous two-layer coating reported in literature. For example, in a study of you, single and two-layer cathodes have been prepared with varied binder content and have been dried at low and high rates. And a two-layer cathode showed similar binder distribution and rate capability as a single-layer reference, although a higher drying temperature had been applied. High drying rates are principally desirable because they enable cost reduction. So a promising performance was shown for cathodes thinner than 100 micrometer. 
However, from this study, important details are unclear. The cutout slurries were fed separately by two pumps at the desired flow rate through each dye to reach equal wet film thicknesses. And the casting was only tuned to similar thicknesses after drying. However, the solid contents and active material contents of the slurries were different. And for this, the active mass loading and the, and the share of active mass in the individual layers is unclear. There is also a study on water-based anodes where a single layer and double layer configuration is compared for common thickness and ultra-thick electrodes. Here we have, uh, we, they saw a stable defect-free two-layer coatings, but uh, the process window was limited. So the lower limit of wet film thickness increased, but there was no intermixing. So in principle, this two layer coating was well uh, performable. But um, for common thickness in the two layer configuration, an increased rate capability and cycle life was found. And in the ultra thick configuration, also two layer electrodes showed the same adhesive force as electrodes with common thickness. So in principle, the results showed also a good um, properties of the two layer electrodes. However, also in this study, the coatings or the layers were tuned to same uh, wet film thickness, although the solid contents and the active material proportion in the slurries were different. And so this, um, in this case, it is not clear how much active material is in which layer. So I will show experiments that try to address this issue. And so how, however, changing the formulation of a suspension affects its behavior during the dispersion process and the rheological properties which determine the behavior during coating after application and during drying. Uh, for example, during the slot die coating of our thick electrodes, the suspension is subjected to a shear rate of about 250 per second. This is shown here in red. So the solid content of each suspension has to be adjusted in a way that the viscosity at this shear rate, which is shown here in red, is appropriate for application. And because of this, the solid contents of the individual suspensions, shown here in blue, can result in very different values. As a consequence, to reach the intended dry mass loading, the wet film thickness of each layer has to be adjusted accordingly. Directly after the application, the leveling and reconstruction of the structure within the wet films takes place under the condition of zero shear rate. This is uh, approximated here with this gray symbols. Because the suspensions exhibit individual shear thinning behavior, the zero shear viscosity of the tuned suspensions can differ strongly. Please note here the logarithmic scale. And also the leveling behavior, which is shown here, and the time for structure recovery very strongly for the different slurries. What can be seen here is that we have a complex correlation between different parameters. When one parameter is adjusted for good processability, this affects other parameters that are also important for the process. Thus, for a re reliable electrode configuration, the whole electrode production process has to be adjusted. The simultaneous two-layer slot die coating also entails further particularities. For a stable coating process avoiding air entrainment, a critical ratio of wet film thicknesses has to be kept. And this restricts the range of possible variations and has to be considered. 
As a further effect, when the suspensions are applied with their customized wet film thicknesses, the real layer thickness may not come out as intended. In our experiments with ultra thick cathodes, we observed that the upper layer was 12% uh, smaller than the lower one, as illustrated in this sketch. This means that the mass loading contributed by the upper wet film can also be 12% more than intended. This deviation is not negligible. However, it is still much lower than the failure of 38% that we calculated would have resulted without a customized wet film thickness. In ultra-thick electrodes compared with the simultaneous layer coating, the EDX analysis of cross-sections reveals that more binder remained near the collector than in a comparable electrode prepared with single layer coating. The pictures even suggest an opposite arrangement as it was intended. However, surprisingly, their adhesive strength is lower, although still high enough for a good processability. But adhesion can be improved when the two layer electrodes are processed with another drying process of the same overall duration as shown, as shown here in, in light blue. To analyze, sorry, there's, to analyze the N, uh, I do not know what this is. To analyze the electrochemical benefit, the volumetric discharge capacity in half cells is shown here as a function of current density. But the two layer coating, by the two layer coating, the rate capability was increased the more, the higher the difference of binder content in the suspensions was. And with an adopted drying procedure seen here in light blue, a further increase of power was reached. And here, 8 milliampere per square centimeter corresponds to a rate of 1C. Alternatively to improving the performance, the two layer coating seems also useful to produce electrodes with the same properties, but with a faster drying process, which can be uh, good for reducing the costs. As a brief overview of issues and advantages of the simultaneous two-layer coating, it has to be considered that a double mixing capacity is necessary, which means either an additional mixer or at least an additional storage tank. Also, additional working time is necessary. And I'd like to mention again the complex interaction of slurry parameters, which demands the corresponding time for process development. The investment of a double slot die and double dosing is comparably small. And the advantages are that by this method, very thick electrodes with good mechanical integrity can be produced with a common or even faster drying process. Furthermore, the loss of power accompanied by ultra-thick electrodes can be drastically reduced without a loss of energy density. And to summarize, I have shown different structuring concepts appropriate to customize the microstructure of ultra-thick electrode composites. One was the graded arrangement of active materials by successive two-layer coating, and the other one was a localized custom, locally customized passive material structure by simultaneous two-layer coating. Both the methods differ with respect to the necessary additional equipment, additional processing time and cost, and the complexity of the respective processes. Both methods were shown to yield significant increase of power density of the ultra-thick electrodes. And uh, finally, I would like to thank my colleagues who did the work and my boss, Margaret Wolfert Mehrens, and I thank the German ministry BMBF for funding our work. And last but not least, I would like to thank you for your attention and I am open for questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for keeping the time.
So um, there was one question on the chat. So the question was, um, what is the TRL level of the two layer electrodes that you have presented today? And in the same question, what would it take or what to bring these electrodes into market? Well, I'm not so familiar with those TRL levels. I would, but I would say five to six. Well, it it was uh, done on a pilot line, uh, ten meters long. Uh, it is a professional coating and uh, drying machine with three uh, oven stations, and the slot die was, um, yeah, directly uh, directly connected to this. It is a professional slot die. However, um, it was the first version that we tried, so it is not optimized yet. But in principle, this uh, technique and uh, this um, concept is transferable to, to large production. And the second question was what it costs or what was it? Uh, no, I, I think that the your answer pretty uh, almost covered, I believe, okay. the first two questions. Oh. And I continue with a few other questions. So um, this is actually coming from me. Um, oftentimes when I look at, I am not into the battery at all, but when I look for electrodes that I like to use for my research, oftentimes the manufacturers are outside of Europe. And I often find the, the commercially available electrodes for supercapacitors, batteries and such coming from, say, China. Um, in your opinion, uh, what can we do when we bring such uh, very promising electrodes for lithium ion batteries into market that we can keep the technology in manufacturing line to ourselves in Europe. Uh, what can we do? Uh, well, um, first of all, I, I think it is uh, always important to be fast because uh, we compete uh, with rather good technology that is already available and um, um, established in, in Asia, for example. Mm -hmm. And so this all this, of course, has um, impact on the prices and if you want to to compete with that you have to be fast to have as much profit from a new technology as possible okay so that's where that difficulty probably lies yes i uh, i think it's always uh, this is the always the only possibility to come mm -hmm. into the market to have a better technology uh, then that was that is established and to be fast with it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I, uh, uh, there is a question, new one. Let me freshen, let me read it to you. Um, which other, maybe lower TRL, approaches to structuring battery electrodes do you consider promising? Well, lower TRL level, um, if you know uh, very uh, um, strategies that have gained very much attention is, for example, laser perforation. But I'm mm. not sure if it has really lower TRL level because also this technology is um, suitable for mass production, although there may be some issues regarding time uh, that it consumes. Um, but I would not say that it is really low TRL. I see. Yeah. And amongst so the perforation process, the this localized um, customiz customization, mm -hmm. and also the graded arrangement, these three, two of which you have elaborated in your presentation, which one of them, in your opinion, is the most uh, promising in a sense that it can be produced at the large scale for mass deployment? Well, I, I think in principle all uh, can be applied 
in large production mm -hmm. and it uh, more depends on the details like um, how the active material particles behave, how the binder behaves uh, to find the appropriate uh, recipes and so on. But um, um, in, in principle, I am more convinced by this two layer coating mm. than by the perforation because um, perforation there are many single steps have to be performed uh, while the coating there you have to to adjust the, the slot ties and the flows and so on once and then you go on continuously and do not have uh, acted uh, actions mm. okay I um, and I'm actually surprised that there was not a question on this issue, but um, um, it, the environmental, from environmental perspective, when we go from the tiny lab scale to the one on TRL level that you are presenting five, six and into the market, there's always this lingering question of how environmentally friendly uh, is this processing in terms of the pollution, if if it is relevant, or the life cycle recycling capabilities, life cycle of the materials. With all of that, um, it, that does it also influence? Did it influence your previous answer? How you have mentioned the two layer is degraded. Uh, what was the word? Degraded arrangement to be your choice. Um, of the most promising method? Is it influenced by such factors? Um, I'm not sure if it's really influenced by such factors. It would, yeah, it would have an influence if we really gain uh, improved cycle life. Then mm. of course the life cycle assessment would be positive, um, but our results are not, not yet so far that I can confirm this. We are at the beginning. So I can only confirm improved rate capability, but for example, for the uh, water-based anodes, they also found uh, extended cycle life. So it may be an improvement. If the quality becomes better, then usually also cycle life improves and then the LCA is also increased. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that would be all the questions, Kelly. Yes, I we started also a little bit earlier. Okay. So, yeah, so, so I think it's mm -hmm. uh, so. If there are no any further questions, thank you very much, Alice, for your presentation. Uh, we will then uh, continue to the uh, next um, to the next um, presenter, which is. Uh, um, which is uh, uh, presented by uh, Francesco Matteucci from European Innovation Council. The title of his presentation is, is an, an EIC, that means European Innovation Council, Perspective on Nanomaterials for Energy Lab to the Fabrication Process. And, uh, Francesco is an innovation manager with 20 years of experience spent as a researcher in material, material science, but also as corporate R&D manager within the field of technologies for renewable energy production and storage, and also as an intermediary for knowledge trying to exploit the research within the field of energy and environment. As R&D corporate manager, he's also co-founded and directed several starts up and joint labs managing public-private partnership. And as a facilitator of knowledge exploitation, he co-managed publicly funded projects, as well as uh, the local in Emilia Romagna Climate Kick Innovation Center. There is also a center of nanotechnologies in uh, and uh, <clears throat> and Francesco. He's uh, he's also been an is an ex uh, scientific expert within the Vanguard Initiative. Um, and um, he is a reviewer of different research projects. He has written over 30 papers. He has five patents and he was also a visiting professor in Ferrara. And he's very popular to give speeches at conferences and workshops. So we are very eager to listen to your presentation. And um, 
so we are a little bit ahead of time, which means we may be a little bit flexible with this with this half an hour. So, Francesco, please start your presentation. I hope you can hear me. Do you see my yes my presentation in full screen mode? It's presentation mode. Oh, so the right one or your uh, the no, this is presentation mode now. Yeah, I'll click. Okay. Uh, the right oh, one. Yes. Okay. Good morning to everybody. Thanks for the for the invitation and, uh, and for the introduction. I I will try to to give some uh, some information on uh, on the ASMEA, the, the new agency uh, where the European Innovation Council uh, has been merged in, and uh, then uh, after I will just uh, show some numbers that we we get out of the EU databases on what has been funded on nanomaterials, and then just uh, before introducing the the few hopefully partially useful uh, considerations I will give on nanomaterials for agency scale up just uh, a, a very quick link to the to the fit for for 55 I mean connections of uh, EU green deal and, and nanomaterials and so let me shortly introduce uh, EIC the formal name it's ASMIA and uh, as you can see from the Horizon Europe, uh, I mean, uh, dashboard, I would call like this, uh, there are three pillars and EIC is uh, in the third pillar. If we speak about numbers, uh, we are speaking about uh, approximately a, a, something like a startup of 1.5 billion euro each year to be invested. I will now show you some, some of the details, trying uh, hopefully to, to explain them uh, to you the, a little better how, how it works and uh, where eventually you can, uh, it can be useful for, for your project development that you're scaling up the, the EIC. So what it's for, the EIC? The EIC is for to, to have the ambition to overcome the European paradox. We know that European paradox means that uh, if we compare the amount of money given to a EU researcher, to another continent researcher, EU researcher normally gets uh, more impact from the scientific point of view. So in terms of, uh, of uh, papers, in terms of knowledge developed. But once we have to exploit this kind of, uh, of know-how and make money, out of it to make the development of the economy in terms of companies, jobs creation and other impacts from the economic and social point of view, EU is no more the leading edge. And so the idea grown up from um, the previous R&D commissioner of European that was Medesh, he said, okay, let's, uh, let's look how we could overcome this, uh, this paradox. And the idea has been to put in place uh, an agency starting, uh, I would say, luckily from previous experiences performed in Japan as well as in US, and just to adapt uh, these ex previous experiences inside the EU context. And so it has been created this, uh, this buzzword to say that EIC wants to become the one-stop shop for breakthrough deep tech market creating innovators. I will just shortly tell you what, what this means, starting from the first concept that is deep tech. We see that deep tech has strongly increased, almost tripled the increase of money invested <clears throat> from the private investors in this kind of, uh, of technology. But what do we mean by deep tech? In my opinion, one of the best definitions of deep tech has been done in this report. And we can uh, shortly say that the deep tech uh, is something that once it was called science-based, and it means that it's something mainly linked to develop uh, hardware more than, uh, than software for sure. And it's uh, at the convergences of different technologies and in particular of different know-hows coming from, as we can see here, for example, matter and energy with the use of computation and cognition and with also the possibility to include in this uh, hardware also sensing and motion. And so the idea out of deep tech, it's clearly defined when we see that to develop a deep tech, there are some requirements. The first of, of all, it's that it is not a short period. From ideation to market uptake, deep tech can take many years, normally around 10 to 15 years, so really huge time. The second one is that it is requested a huge amount of money. Deep tech requires money. To be, to be used to develop the knowledge because deep tech as starts from the knowledge use. And this means that we have to put in place all the culture on how to exploit the knowledge. And this means once again, the third thing, the third characteristic of this deep tech is that it is developed really in an ecosystem 
That means in a really open innovation approach. Normally, it doesn't work, the closed innovation inside deep tech. It means that to develop it, certain steps and certain design enclosed inside the innovation management has to be put in place. And when we look at uh, nanotechnologies or nanomaterials, we remember that they have been called CAT, a key enabling technology. And in my humble opinion, they are one of the most attractive deep tech that we can see now under development. And so how EIC wants to support this deep tech, as I said before, in one-stop shop. Why one-stop shop? Because the ambition and the reality of EIC is the fact that we are the only executive agency of European Commission that can contemporarily make policy. That means we write our own yearly work program. And second, we implement the support to our funded projects in a way that we call hands-on or proactive management. I will explain this later, what does it mean? But to see the financing tools that we have got inside EIC, you can see from, from the slides, there are three. The Pathfinder, that is the legacy. So the former, before Pathfinder, it was FEAT, Future Emerging Technologies. It has simply changed the name, but it's the same. And we can see here, that Pathfinder starts from breakthrough ideas at very low TRL, approximately one to two. If I am to speak and to compare it with the pillar one ERC, Pathfinder, there is not such a big difference compared to ERC, unless the fact that Pathfinder is open to partnerships and Pathfinder is finally aimed at developing innovation. So at looking at how we can apply the knowledge that we have developed. The second call is the transition. It's a limited participation call because only winners of FET or Pathfinder and an ERC proof of concept can apply. And transition, the name transition is exactly because it wants to help to fund the transition from the proof of concept to the prototype phase. So from the what normally is the three, uh, TRL three to four to the TRL five to six. And also this transition is open to partnership. Then we have got the third one that is the accelerator. It is not correct to say that it is the former SME instrument because SME instrument was not strongly linked to breakthrough deep tech. So accelerator is the mono beneficiary call for small medium enterprises that want to start from a prototype and bring it to the market. So approximately from TRL five to six to TRL eight. But where is the peculiarity of, uh, of a Pathfinder Transition Accelerator? As first, we can say that they have two types of calls, as we can see here. They all have an open call and a challenge call. The open means open, no topic prescription, whatever topic you want. The challenge, instead, we have challenges that we want to reach results and develop technologies, innovation journeys inside these challenges. Another innovation inside this support scheme is the fact that, that in Accelerator, you can get the money in two ways, grants or equity, or merging these two type of, of funding. Why? Because it has been put in place since July 2020, the first ever European Commission Venture Capitalist Fund called EIC Fund. Another innovation of the support schemes is the fact that each winner can get out of the support a dedicated support by the program managers and by the business acceleration services. Now, let me, let, let me shortly say what does it mean to help. The help means to help in connecting, for example, in the case of Pathfinder, with the, with the knowledge needed to put in place an innovation journey, so to go ahead. So there are possibility to have trainings, there are a possibility to connect with other stakeholders. There are the possibility to look at the business model development. And there is a possibility to use this not so new, this approach that the IC wants to put in place through the program managers, that is this portfolio approach. That means grouping the projects on similar topics, sectorial topics, and to help them go in the same direction of developing the innovation. So here we see, that the business acceleration services provided are for all the kind of calls of support schemes, so for Pathfinder, Transitional Accelerator, and the activities we can see that are obviously partially different because in Pathfinder we provide more explore help, in Transition more exploit, 
and in accelerator where we speak today, more scale up. But as I said before, the program manager are a new uh, kind of uh, employees inside European commissions. They are time limited and they have mainly three goals. The first one is why I'm here today to be the EANC ambassador, to speak about the EAC support schemes and try to involve the people to bring to us their best ideas and to write the best proposals. The second one is also the possibility as ENC ambassador to link the different activities of different other funding agencies in other countries or continents. But the two technical and scientific ones are that the program manager should bring inside the ENC the content, the hands-on and proactive man management with the content. And so we are responsible for identifying emerging challenges. And in doing this, we connect with the community to understand which are the challenges, and the second part is, I said before, this portfolio and zone approach. We group the projects, we try to make them work together and connect them together with our colleagues, obviously, with the different and relevant stakeholders. So concerning the challenges, what here I would like to say is that we are open to speak with people that consider a broad topic that could be a relevant challenge for the EIC yearly um, work program. With my colleague, Marco Antonio Pantaleo, we, we interviewed, we had discussion with almost 50 experts from March to May with single or one-to-one -one interviews to understand which could be the challenges. We had our studies and our ideas. We discussed with these experts and we are open next year to discuss for the future challenges. And how it has gone, quite simple to say the methodology for the cell and development, there has been an idea, an initiation process, a guidance, and obviously the outcome that you will see if everything works in the proper way, the 25th of November, where 2022 EIC work program will be presented inside the EIC summit. Just an example with my colleague Pantaleo, this year we, we set up the challenge that will close the 27th of October on the Pathfinder, for example, the challenge is novel roads to green hydrogen production. And obviously another action that we perform and every year we hope will be useful is that we write the challenge guide. That means each program manager is as right as written. Mark and me, we write it together because we work together. We wrote the challenge guide where we explain which could be the project we would like to see inside the ones that will be funded. And uh, just let me go to the second part of the talk. I, I, I still have 10 minutes. And uh, what, uh, were, what is the idea? The idea is to show you that when, when I started to work in nanomaterials, unfortunately, it was more than 15 years ago, I always remember that everybody taught me that the starting point of nanotechnology was the investment uh, by US in their nanotechnology initiative, $1 billion. I was much younger than today. And I remember when everybody told me $1 billion, I said, oh guys, a lot of money. When few weeks ago with my, my friend, uh, Roberto Gianantonio, we, we organized a meeting in non-innovation. He told me, hey, Francesco, have a look at the numbers because how much money do we did the European Commission invested in, in nanotechnology? And I don't know if you ever looked at these numbers. These are number quite uh, referenced because are taken from a EU database. And we can see that in the last 20 years, European Commission has invested approximately 10.5 billion euros. But if we focus, we see that at the beginning of the FP6, the money has not been a lot. In FP7, it has increased. In age 2020, it has really grown up. And we see the same funding. I took as an example, a, a snapshot of ERC funds on nanotechnology. And we see that also on the science side, the increase of funding from FP6 to FP7, age 2020 has been really incremental. But what do we see? We see that this is nice to know. There has been a strategy behind. And this strategy is quite similar to the one when we look about, when we speak about scaling up of nanomaterials. That means the first money in FP6, we see it has been devoted to few applications. So when we compare it to the scale up of nanomaterials, we see that the beginning we might look for few applications. But when this goes on, we can look for a broader kind of applications. So something like we understand that we can use our nanomaterials in different applications. And we see the same happening in, H20, in FP7 funding because you see the number of topics has strongly increased where the money has been put linked to nanomaterials. And when we go to H2020, we see that the money, 
has been given to a huge number of projects with different applications for nanotechnology. And also the community has been created. So once again, if we compare it to the nanomaterial scale up, it means that at the beginning we start, we understand we want to scale it up and we see few applications. Then we see that the application has many more, but in the end, we have to develop our ecosystem. We have to tell to the people that we have the infrastructure able and capable to sell the customized, for example, nanomaterials, because we are able to scale up the production. And if we see something that is a, a, another relevant snapshot on the right side of this slide, we can see that it has not so much increased in the last five years, the amount of money given by European Commission to SMEs scaling up nanotechnologies. This means, in my humble opinion, that there is a lot, again, to be exploited. There are a lot of startups of SMEs that might be ready to scale up, and they are looking for this process that is once again a deep tech scale up typical process of increasing the knowledge, scaling up the technology, and looking for business development applications. So if we look, I don't need to tell you, you are all wonderful scientists, much better than me, but we know that Fit for 55 inside the European Green Deal showed us that there are so many applications in the energy supply chain where nanomaterials or nanotechnology can strongly impact and where it's relevant to understand the added value, the value proposition of nanotechnology, where they can really increase as we have seen, for example, from Professor Hoffman in the previous one, where nanotechnology has been able to increase this lithium ion batteries electrode scaling up and develop new and possible future know-hows where we can use this kind of know-how. And uh, let me sum up some, uh, some uh, experiences that I had when I was corporate R&D manager is that uh, when we look for the scale up, we have to consider many factors. These are not science factors. These are industrial or manufacturing factors, but also business factors. When we look, for example, at the quality, at the raw material suppliers, when we look, for example, of the capability to scale up, that we have to consider easy, in theory, concepts like reproducibility, like performance. And we have, for sure, to consider, for example, where needed to develop if they do not exist, in situ characterization techniques to exactly understand if the quality of the product is always the same, if the cost is the same. When we speak about cost, we have to look at the market. So when scaling up, we don't need only scientists. We need business developers and we need this new figure that in US is present and in Europe is not so well developed, that, is, that are the innovation managers. People capable of understanding the, the science behind, but able to understand the application, the market where this, uh, this wonderful technology can go. And I mean, <clears throat> for sure, when, uh, when we look at another aspect, as I was saying a few minutes ago, when we look at the scaling up, we have to consider the fundraising strategy. If we look for governmental funding as EIC can provide, are we sure that this is, in, this is in line with the time frame where we are looking for? Is it, okay, we do a strategy, we apply. We know that the success rate is low, so we have to make a wonderful presentation and also have some luck. On the other side, uh, if we look that we need industry involvement, maybe we can look for a corporate VC. Maybe we can look for a corporate application. So inside our ecosystem, in the same way, we should look at the final users or at the value chain suppliers. And so we have to consider that we are inside an ecosystem where we can get ideas, know-how linked to the science for sure, but links also to the regulation and to the business issues. So it's relevant to focus at the beginning normally on really few applications and try to go to the market. It's crucial to have the first customer when we look for money, we have to have the strategy that we are able to show some relevant requirements for market and for fundraising. That means we have got the right team that is able to look in the right direction. And we have to look for the right amount of money, finance and resources, human resources, sorry, are part of the resources that are relevant in this scale up. 
And we do not need to, to look only, once again, from the science, but also from the market part. So for sure, as I was saying, we have to look at the market opportunity. We have to develop a proper exploitation strategy. We have to understand if we can do the make or the buy strategy. In 2007, I had to scale up a nanotitanium dioxide patented technology of synthesis, and we didn't know how to scale it up. We were starting to buy reactors when we found, luckily, after quite a good research, that there was a, a reactor good for us at 500 kilometers. We, we rented it for two weeks and we made our scale up up to 100 liters. Was it lucky? Yeah, we were lucky. But on the other side, we looked for it. Not always is needed to buy so many equipments. There are so many wonderful equipments in Europe and also all over the world. And for sure, it is crucial not to look at the partners as single partners, but to look them as the supply chain that can help us also in looking for scaling up our facilities. And for sure, we have to do a very good customer segmentation to understand where the needs are. And as I said before, to look for normative regularity issues and for sure to develop a good business plan and good, uh, sorry, good business development plan, including the communication, the right people, as to know what we are doing and why we are doing and why they have to come to us to buy our products or to give us the money because they can help us in reaching the final steps of our scaling up. So it's crucial to look at the stakeholder analysis, to map the stakeholders, to categorize, to engage with them. And to do this is not an easy job. If we look on the other side of innovation managers, maybe here, it is needed an innovation manager with also communicating, sorry, with community management skills because we have to network with external stakeholders. And there are different stakeholders that has got different languages with whom we have to speak always in the right way. For example, if we speak with VC, they do not need to be in love with our technology. They want to understand that they can make out of our technology a lot of money. They are financial guys. They want to look at the market, at the money they can get not that the wonderful technology. And I know that this is not easy to explain them and to speak with them because I was a researcher and I loved my know-how. Now I'm something like a hybrid creature and I, I don't know exactly what I like, but I know that when I speak with a VC, I don't have to bore him with my wonderful XRPD uh, diffractograms or things like this. And so to conclude, when we look at the fundraising strategy for the scale up, we have really to understand which is the best one for us. Is it public or private money? We have seen that EIC can provide a lot of help and a lot of support content wise with different type of support schemes and with different support ranging from science to business. And we have seen that European Commission has invested a lot of money in nanomaterials development. And there is a lot of things, a lot of know-how to be exploited in the right way with a deep tech approach, in, with an innovation management customized approach, it's crucial to develop the right strategy to scale up, not only the science and technical strategy, but also, as I said before, the fundraising strategy, the engagement strategy, and everything that is linked to the final applications to understand why people should buy our products. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Francesco, for this uh, very clear overview of the EIC or EI, EISMEA, the structure, the services, and the strategy behind your actions. There are a couple of questions on the chat that I will go straight in. The first question is, have you ever thought of opening funding possibilities through some kind of crowdfunding? where one could invest in the business under certain conditions? I mean, uh, personally, the, if the question is personally, I, I almost only worked in the deep tech. So crowdfunding for the deep tech, maybe it's not the best uh, uh, fundraising strategy because crowdfunding normally doesn't give a lot of money to the, I mean, it's for small, more on socially impacting uh, projects normally. So from my side, I'm quite ignorant of crowdfunding. I studied it, but I never experienced it. But I would feel that for the fundraising of uh, deep tech and nanomaterials in particular, it might not be the best way to look at. 
Um, I have a follow-up question, very simple on that. Uh, but why do you think it is not suitable because of the high risk or because of the capital the, the capital investment that is too large for deep tech? Yeah, the second, the second one, for sure, for, for mm -hmm. the capital, yeah. Okay. Okay, so the second question on the chat is, do you often get applications from large companies or is this aimed EIC funding scheme? exclusively at SMEs or spin-offs? No, no, we look, uh, we inside our network, uh, my colleague Pantaleo and me, we work a lot with uh, with corporates. We work with, with all the all the companies from small to big ones. We are open with, there are colleagues of us inside the business acceleration services that organizes also a kind of matchmaking with corporates that mm -hmm. are called corporate day events where the corporates uh, put in place their uh, show their challenges and our colleagues try to 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 promote their challenges of the corporates with small medium enterprises just to answer and just to to find the relevant relevant answers and another job that we do is trying as i said before through this i would say it's not correct to say new but in european commission unfortunately it is new with this content wise approach my colleague and me and all the other program managers because we are part of an office obviously we work trying to combine the different projects and try to help them to work together where needed. And in particular, try to look once again at really the final science that might be needed, but in particular also at the final applications. Just the day before yesterday, Sako, I was discussing with my colleague Marco of an idea of him concerning, for example, completely different topic. I'm speaking about hydrogen storage and utilization. And he, he looked at something that maybe has not been thought before. And this is a typical example where our job might be useful because we are happy and uh, uh, good to see a lot of projects. Sacco. Every day we really see, I wouldn't say dozens of projects, but something like this. So the EIC really would like to use our experience and our huge agency, because we are more than 600 uh, employees experience in companies involvement in research center to discuss potential links really to exploit. Many times exploitation is not a linear process. It's mm -hmm. a complex process where we can work, as I like to say, as intermediary of knowledge, putting different knowledges together. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here are a couple more questions. Um, among the key enabling factors you have cited, can you rank, in your opinion, the most important ones for Europe to improve? Okay, if I, I start from the one that in my opinion is not needed. I don't think that is so much needed to, con I speak for example of my country that I know quite well, Italy. I don't think that it is so needed to continuously buy so many characterization for materials uh, instruments. There are so many in, in Italy that we do not map. So from the facility point of view, Sacco, I feel that the key enabling factor we should need are the scaling up facilities. There are some, we, you all know better than me that the EU uh, funded in age 2020, the innovation test beds where you can go and rely on them on uh, your also scaling up. So there are some of these. I don't know if everything has been covered. It's, it's my fault. We can check together. But uh, for sure, the scaling up facility is one key enabling factor. And another two, in my opinion, priorities that to be priorita prioritized, key enabling factors are the innovation management cultures inside mm -hmm. R&D. I am fighting with uh, with my colleague, uh, with my friend Roberto, and with my colleague Marco, trying to bridge, for example, the PhDs' knowledge, not only driving them to research know-how, but to innovation know-how. We need innovation managers in Europe, able to understand how to make money out of it. And they also have to, I know that it's terrible for a researcher, what I will say, but they should love also the money, not only the wonderful papers. This is, you know, the typical aggressive way with which uh, entrepreneurs look at. Every day I can buy something new, but I can sell something new. And last but not least, what I feel, Sako, that is really needed, and our colleague from European uh, Innovation, from EIT, uh, they work a lot, is to develop the community, the capability to speak together among people. 
Because once again, really last night, I was reading an interesting book on corporate venture capitalists. And the heading of the book was this, uh, this few lines from one of the biggest VC all over the world that said, I don't want to be bored with long emails. I want short emails where you show me in few lines if I or I cannot get money out of your wonderful technology. And this know-how, Sako, can be developed if we really promote the, the speaking of the different people. We are trying in EIC. For example, last year we had this uh, FET briefing event on green tech mm -hmm. where we tried to put VC corporates in front of small, medium enterprises. With my colleague Marco, we are trying to plan something like visits from November to our funded projects, where we would like to link these visits with events, half a day workshops inside the member states ecosystem of innovation community on green techs, where we really try to, to show the good examples we can bring, but also the failures. Innovation is made up of more failures than successes. Okay. Well, thank you, because uh, what you have just said answers one of the last questions It was on the chat about the uh, if lack of innovation managers in Europe was culture or not, the answer appears to be yes. And there are things, especially in EIC, that you're doing to change this culture. Um, one last question that I see on the chat is that what is your interaction between ERC and also the Director, Director General of RTZ? DG okay. RTD. DG RTD, the, uh, we, co we, I mean, Marco and me, Marco Antonio, uh, we collaborate with many DGs because we are SACO in different co creation groups for the world programs. So, who is giving us the money? The mother of the money is always DG RTD. Okay. So, we collaborate with them on, on different renewable energies as well as the materials for energy, as well as energy system units. So, we collaborate sector wise with the uh, DGRTD, DGNR, DGClima, DGENV, because we look also environment side. Concerning ERC, I have to say that uh, we are trying, we, we, we are collaborating with them. It's not an easy way to collaborate because the approach of ERC is strongly different. They have a bottom-up approach while 30% of our budget is top-down. So we like to disturb the wonderful scientists. We like to stress them with not nice questions. We want to put them in a difficult position to understand when maybe it's better for our funded project to look for other exploitation managers or other networks. So we, we work in this way. So we collaborate with ERC. Next year, ERC and EIC most probably uh, will organize an event on energy on uh, the common uh, projects, the same as in 2021, it has been done on health by our colleague Danos. And so we collaborate with them. As you can see, Sako, the transition possibility has been open to ERC proof of concept. Nevertheless, the proof of concept is not, uh, I mean, exactly the, the same way, the same culture of Pathfinder. We open this opportunity to, so to, to bring the ERC proof of concept inside our, our transition. And we, we will start the evaluation of the first transition. So we will see if I am wrong, I hope to be wrong, or if I'm right. That means if the ERC proof of concept are really ready for transitioning their know-how to the TRL6. You are muted, Sako. Yeah. You're right. Yes, I was muted. Sorry about that. Well, thank you so much, um, Francesco. Uh, back to you, Kelly. Yes, thank you very much. Lucky that we you had a little bit of extra time. Very interesting discussion. Now we will go to the next uh, presentation. Uh, it um, casting materials acceleration platform and accelerated search for thermal electric materials. That's the title. It's, it's a joint presentation by Mark Kostras and Ole Löwig. Mark is from Canada and Ole from Norway, Sintef. So Mark is a material scientist in National Resources Canada and he leads the international effort to promote autonomous or self-driving laboratories uh, under emissions innovation materials for energy innovation platform. Today, the, his part of the talk will focus on the current progress in the development of high temperature or casting experimental platform. 
and Ole Martin Löwig, he's a chief scientist at Sintef, Sustainable Energy Technology and professor at the Center for Material Science and Nanotechnology at the University of Oslo in Norway. And his area, uh, research areas are on, on the development materials for sustainable energy. And his part of the presentation here will present screening efforts to identify new thermoelectric materials for enhanced recovery of waste heat. So please, and um, since now we're on track, so now we have to keep within the 30 minutes. So please start. Thanks very much and welcome from Canada. It's a pleasure to be here and present in this. And I have to say that uh, following Francesco, uh, you had a number of points that were very poignant and relevant to what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, process automation, chemical development via AI and having the right team. And hopefully at the end of my presentation, I'll be able to show you that those are all very, very important things. Uh, as a start, uh, I wanted to highlight that I can't possibly show you everything about the history, the five-year history through Mission Innovation that got us to where we are today. But I'm the Canadian representative and I'm the, one of the co-leads for the Mission Innovation Innovation Challenge on Clean Energy Materials. So early in the process of developing that, we identified a unique opportunity within our lab to look at thermoelectric materials. And so having the science being developed and realizing where to apply materials acceleration platforms was a critical portion of this. Today, I'm gonna to focus on the, the map itself, the, the self-driving laboratory itself. And so my talk will not cover everything that led up to it through mission innovation. First of all, what is a materials acceleration platform? Well, this, the center graphic is a very simple way of showing that what we're looking at is robotic automation, one of Francesco's points, that links both the synthesis and the characterization together. And what we want to be able to do is drive that computational controllers, but through AI to develop an experimental program choose that experiments that are going along so that we can run this more than just a normal workday, so that we can run it 24 seven. We have to also realize that high performance computing has come a long way and there's very high power computing, which, which Ola will talk about in, in the second portion of this talk. So linking all of these technologies into a platform that delivers experiments in an autonomous, or self-driving manner is a critical um, item here. One of the other things on MAPS Essentials is that you have to have pre-existing knowledge. You can't start from scratch necessarily. You have to have a problem that you're trying to solve robotically or in an automated way. The characteristics of a, a map I wanted to highlight we can look at much, much higher dimensional experimental space. We can have more factors, more levels. We can search a space that's massive. In a conversation I had just recently, we were talking about a, a hundred in a thousand times broader a system that we would look at experimentally using the uh, automated technologies. It doesn't need prior data as well. So we can look at these problems and try and solve problems that allow us to um, explore space that has not been explored and we don't have a lot of data for it. We just have to know what the technical gap or problem is. It has a wide uh, uh, application impact. We can look at the material, we can look at the component or we can look at the device level. And I'll show you how this project that I, that I developed in, in Canada is doing all of those. An important one too about scalability, <clears throat> excuse me, is that we want to look at both the material and the manufacturing process parameters in situ. So we'll, we'll show how that fits within the uh, idea of scalability, taking it from lab to product. 
So how do we define a map problem? Well, first of all, you have to look at what you're trying to work on. Is it a device, an associated assembly process? Is it the components or the associated materials, as I, as I mentioned before? Then you have to say, what are the gaps? Where can I find uh, something that inhibits our ability to scale or, or inhibits our ability to make the material in the first place to decide the optimum material? For maps themselves, we have what I called or, or coined recently sparks. We have to look at, can we synthesize? Do we know how to do the experimental planning? And how do we use artificial intelligence? And I'll go through some of the, the items that we're looking at for that. The robotic automation, how do we implement robotic automation? Uh, Francesco talked about having the right team. What team, what single group could I find that could do all of these at the same time and understand the characterization and contribute to the simulation? So I wanted to highlight, you need to understand that the, the problem that you're trying to solve fits within the model of autonomous or self-driving laboratories. So my example today, and, and it's the one that we chose first because in all honesty, it was an easy one when we recognized what we were trying to do. In this case, it's a thermoelectric generator. So we chose the device, thermoelectric generator. We're looking at a little bit at joining technologies, but we're not studying it in the map. On the component level, we are looking at the thermoelectric element the material itself that does the conversion of waste heat to electricity. And so our focus was on the, the material. We knew the family or type of material we were looking at. We were going to vary the composition, the structure, and the process. Very importantly, the process, the manufacturing parameters that will make a good material. We, looked, we also knew the substrates that we were trying to put them on. We have an industry partner. And one of the things that we certainly understand is having the manufacturing, downstream manufacturing partner involved allows us to be able to look at the real problems associated with the device we're trying to make. The funding constraints, how much money do we have? How much uh, do we need operating? Do we need capital? In our case, we needed capital. We had to, to capitalize the characterization needed. We had to also capitalize the robotic system, which did not exist. And having the uh, partners, the R&D, I guess we had a, a, an assemblance of the, the critical features we needed, the mechatronics engineering, the computation. We had the materials expertise, some of that. We needed to really strengthen that to make this work. What we did have is that commercialization pathway through our manufacturing partner. So what is a casting map? Casting maps, when I showed the, the simple schematic, we talk about having the ability to make or synthesize the material. So we had to develop all the tools needed to make the, the material. Then we start, and, and it's in uh, a slightly faded version because we're still working on the characterization side but we're trying to um, automate the characterization with the synthesis. The synthesis is our focus right now. So we're building a high temperature melt and solidified process. We're applying that casting map, melt and solidify, to thermoelectrics in this specific case. Um, really, this is set up to develop the, and assess the process at, whether it's feasible to run experiments for thermoelectrics on this map and looking at the process parameters and being able to scale it in the future. I wanted to show just something early on. We develop a process flow and I'm only showing you the last few um, steps of the, the process, which are the characterization. We plan to integrate microstructural analysis, compositional, um, XRD, uh, X-ray diffraction uh, analysis in situ online to be able to measure things and feed back information to the AI brain, the computational brain, so that we can control the next experiment. Seebeck co coefficient is a, is a critical parameter in thermoelectrics, thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity, 
And not only are we going to look at the material, we're going to look at an assembled junction. We bought a, a device tester, a thermoelectric device tester, and it is in. it will be integrated into the actual platform to tell us how good the device is, not just the material, the actual device in its, in its entirety. Some important steps, and these are just a, a couple uh, examples. The Mettler-Toledo balance is how we can get compositional control with our, with our universal robot that picks up materials, moves it to the uh, micro balance, dispenses it, and then um, as allows us to take that capsule and go to a, a, a location where we can crimp the capsule closed. We have to have a, a closed environment. And so we de develop um, a system ourselves to be able to do that encapsulation. Another thing that's important is that we work a lot on the device in integrating the, the various features, but we get right into the Metler, uh, Toledo balance and uh, monitor various effects. So in, in our case, the platform is shown sort of uh, schematically here where the robot comes out, goes to the balance, then moves to a furnace and chilling system. In our case, we'll be looking at various methods of heating, resistive induction and infrared, depending on the materials we're working on. Not all of those will be used for thermoelectrics, but we're divide, des designing it to have those in so that we can process virtually any material that requires a melt and solidify. On the communication side, something that really has to be taken into account, it's important that we look at how we take micro microcontrollers to each device and then have a central nervous system that has to do the traffic control. So communication, data scientists are critical for that feature. In terms of computational processes, this, this is an important slide because I talked about experimental planning. I can't really tell you a lot about it in the, in the short time, but one of the things we use AI for is to search that large experimental space. We also use computation to look at the act of learning, the modeling, how to decide where we might look next based on how much we know about the response at a given time. And so mapping out large areas of response and then tailoring the next experiment to that. My last comment will be that simulation, and, and Ola will talk about this, simulation is important in, a, in an automated system, but how do we know when we have simulated data versus uh, experimental data and how to treat that information? So we're working on algorithms that will allow us to differentiate between the two and respond meaningfully to, the, to that information. So this was the experimental side and I'll leave the next portion for Ola to cover. Thank you. I think you need to stop your presentation. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to get back. Sorry, it's, it's one of these uh, meeting controls. Ah. Stop sharing. Sorry, I was on the wrong screen, Ola. Exactly, perfect. Yeah. So I'll take over um, and um, talk a little bit about um, the accelerated search for thermoelectric materials, um, covering some, some of the parts that Mark did not uh, talk about in, in detail and his part of the talk. Um, I'm from, from CENTIF. Um, which is um, one of the biggest polytechnical uh, research institutes in, um, in, or in Europe. Uh, we have um, a big variety of uh, different materials technologies covered. Uh, today I'm going to focus on thermoelectric uh, materials as one example of functional materials that we work with. Um, just a very brief introduction to, to, the, to, the, to this technology. It's, uh, it's a way of converting between uh, heat and electric uh, energy. Um, one way is to, to cool down um, in various applications um, as, as, a, as a general heat pump. Another one is uh, in the reversal to generate electricity from heat. So 
given that um, more than 60% of the energy that that uh, is turned is spent in in, uh, in the world is actually available as, as heat as heat this gives a great potential for for uh, electricity generation from a variety of sources um, if you hear about thermoelectrics you all uh, the figure of merit which is a dimensional less uh, number it's usually around one as the highest um, in order to have a rule of thumb you can think that if you have a cold side at room temperature at a, any given temperature uh, a figure of merit of one gives a maximum efficiency of 10 percent so just multiply the figure of merit by approximately 10 and you will get the efficiency in uh, in terms of percent at the given temperature it's it's uh, actually quite remarkable how how the different curves follow like this one of the biggest problems with uh, the current generation of thermoelectric materials is that they are toxic or rare or expensive or, or all of them. So we would like to replace them and at the same time even go to a higher figure of merit. And now this is uh, challenging because uh, if you change the, ch the charge carrier concentration, which is uh, a very important uh, number going from an insulator to a metal, um, the different tra transport um, properties go in different directions. So you have an optimum uh, in the middle. So if you try to squeeze on one side, uh, something will pop out on, on the other side. And uh, it, it is really difficult to, uh, to uh, gain more if you uh, are on the, on the optimal uh, side. Um, nevertheless, it is possible to find this optimum for a variety of, of um, materials. We have done this um, with atomistic based screening from um, first principles. Um, I will not go into detail. Um, there's a lot of uh, very nice gory details that I would love to present to you, but I know that there is no time for, the, uh, for that today. Um, only show that theoretically uh, there are quite high numbers uh, of the figure of merit for some materials. Some of them have not been realized um, still. So we have a, a TRL of one. Some have been very heavily exploited uh, and uh, optimized experimentally and um, uh, may be used uh, in practice. Um, but even if you have materials with quite high figure merits and you go to companies and say, okay, won't you uh, try to make a device from this? It's not necessarily everything. Um, if you have elements that are based on, um, if you have uh, uh, materials based on elements that are toxic or very um, expensive and rare, tellurium is one of the most common materials, uh, elements in, in thermoelectric materials, for, for instance. And uh, it's really not very common in, in, uh, in the earth crust. This is going to be a, a big challenge. And also um, whether you can uh, continue exploiting materials for a long time is uh, a matter of uh, concern for many materials that are not, not even as scarce um, as this map shows you. This is not uh, the only um, challenge. Another challenge is that many materials are difficult to stabilize. They may, may be easily uh, oxidized. Um, you have uh, elements that uh, can be sublimated at uh, the temperatures uh, relevant for uh, exploitation and so on. And there are also various other metallurgy issues uh, connected to the melting point, um, brittleness, and so on, that may make it uh, difficult to actually make a device from the material. Another point is that uh, if you want to bring the current out of the device, you need some kind of metallization. This is actually a very weak point in many devices. and. Uh, and this is often where you see that uh, the, de the device breaks. You need low electrical and thermal resistance, but you also need uh, a low um, living time. Um, 
and that's uh, determined by uh, the, the interface properties. You also need to uh, package and make a system. So this means you have a multi-dimensional uh, problem that needs to be optimized. I've drawn six of those uh, dimensions here. Um, there are, of course, several others, and they all need to be optimized. Now, typical materials that you see in the literature, uh, in, the, in the academic literature, are optimized uh, for a high figure of merit as possible. They're often, often stable enough, uh, and they have uh, good uh, other issues that that make it that makes it possible to make devices. But cost is often not an issue, and they're also, also often toxic. Um, other compounds that are on the list may be disregarded because they have, don't have the best figure of merit. But if you make a threshold um, of all the, the parameters, and I think this should be done in, when you talk about innovation, uh, maybe uh, the typical compound has a dead end because of too high cost, or maybe because of toxicity. And um, the hypothetical compound number two is maybe better uh, from an innovation uh, perspective. And this is my take home message. It is possible to predict materials properties that may give you fantastic uh, materials uh, from the, the perspective of um, going for the world record of, um, of uh, therm thermoelectrics. But you should also uh, address all the other issues. Um, much can be done in high throughput, as Mark uh, addressed. Um, and this should really be, our, I think, uh, the next aim of many of the labs working in this, in this field and in the near future. And, and thus we can address the complex multidimensional optimization challenge that we need to solve. Thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting joint um, presentation one on MAP. Uh, I have a few questions on that one and also on the thermoelectric uh, materials themselves. There is one question um, uh, from on the chat, which is for uh, Dr. Lovic. I hope I didn't pronounce your name too badly. That's okay, that's good. Um, uh, the, the person is a little confused. He says that, Figure of merit ZT, it is a compound. Can you clarify? Not sure the question is. Okay, uh, the figure of merit um, is defined uh, from um, three of the, the, the fundamental transport properties of a material. It's the uh, thermal and electrical um, yeah. connectivities and the Zeebeck coefficient. Yeah. And, and um, that can be optimized by changing the to the charge carrier concentration. Um, it is uh, temperature dependent, which means that it has uh, one value on, at one end of the material and another value at another end uh, part of the material if you have a, a temperature gradient. Um, and the slides I showed um, has a very simplified view of that. Uh, if you go through it, you have uh, um, the, the, the efficiency is a function of uh, actually the, the figure merit uh, throughout the material and you need to integrate that and um, I only showed the result. Um, I'm not sure if that answers this question but that's, that's uh, at least uh, one possible response. Mm -hmm. We'll see if the person would react again. Um, the last part of the presentation was very interesting also in a sense that it will connect directly to the next series of the workshop, which is Digital Twin, that will take in account, therefore, the packaging and all around systems. And then there will be many um, presentations, I imagine, which would use machine learning and the similar approaches that you have presented. So I, my question is at Syntef, with this a holistic approach of creating a new thermoelectric generator device, have you, have, have you already some results um, of the device itself that takes an account of optimizing all of the, the spider cobweb chart? 
or this is still ongoing project? I mean, it's always this, ongoing, of course. But. <laughs> yes, indeed. This is ongoing. Um, we have um, so far had our uh, highest attention to the first part, um, the, the screening. We have made devices ourselves um, with a, a quite terrible um, uh, efficiency, to be honest. <laughs> and that's, and that's mm -hmm. uh, partly due to the metallization issues. Um, and we would love to, to go further in that direction. And I hope that the collaboration with Mark uh, Kostras uh, would facilitate that. Um, and we are defi definitely thinking in that direction. And there are also companies in, in Norway that, uh, that could um, be a part of uh, such uh, development. Mm. Um, there's one question there for now on map. Uh, it's kind of actually coming from me. So it is a very robust and a very complete uh, robotic automated synthesis characterization all the way to the other end of the spectrum of the material processing. So as you have mentioned, capital or the funding becomes a, one of the crucial issues in running and keep the platform going. So in this tag map, um, how is this uh, is, how is the funding being taken care of and how, and more importantly how 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 did it come about how did you succeed in building this platform how long did it take and how are you sustaining the platform's function right a very good question uh, I guess really one of the things that we have to realize is that mission innovation started five years ago so in the time between its starting and the innovation challenges being identified four years ago, and then a project in Canada where we spent $8 million to demonstrate a map it, at the University of British Columbia, the three-year project's already done now. But that time frame is very short. So we, we initiated um, by a demonstration project where Anarchan invested $8 million in a $11 million project. And the um, results of which showed in collaboration with many other people around the world that maps were viable approaches to be able to do things. On the TEG map, we knew that the thermoelectrics was important about three years ago. And we had the idea to build a casting or a high temperature processing map that could solve all types of problems. High entropy alloys could be a, a target for us. Uh, regular metals could be a target for us to optimize in terms of structure and property and, and responses. In this case, we had enough infrastructure on thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity already in place mm -hmm. that, that we had some of the capital we did not have the device tester, for instance. Mm -hmm. And so that's a quarter million dollars. Our focus in virtually all of our funding, much of our funding, went to the capital in, in terms of our funded project from NRCAN. We have funding from NRCAN to do this. So the it's a slower process when you have to wait each year to, to obtain the capital to be able to, to build the system. We also had COVID where we were just starting in, in more intensity to assemble the equipment. And actually the work, the mechatronics work to integrate the equipment was adversely affected, of course. So the time frame is, is a little bit longer. However, the plan has not changed. Uh, we, are, we virtually have all the equipment we need. That equipment can be used on many other problems. It, it's, it's, an, it, it's a really a functional map and we're just applying it to thermoelectrics. I'll highlight too, Ola highlighted some of the interesting things, non-toxic, earth abundant, environmentally friendly materials. We are focusing our efforts on magnesium silicide, magnesium stannate, and mm -hmm. manganese silicide in, in terms of making these, these devices. And so our optimization already filtered out some of those toxic, costly um, materials. Okay, thank you very much. Your last bit of that actually uh, accidentally answers perhaps the question which just was posted on the chat that uh, this is about the, uh, the rare and toxic materials. Uh, the person who asked was that, is this perhaps the most difficult to solve 
uh, issue in the thermoelectric devices. And you mentioned that, that you are focusing yeah, the, and, and in, I think it's those ba balance parameters, and Ola, Ola mm -hmm. presented that very nicely. It's mm -hmm. a set of balance parameters, whether it's the material optimization or device optimization, or if it's the bigger picture, how do we sell this in, mm -hmm. in, in an environmentally conscious, in, in a toxic, chemical conscious way? And so balancing all the parameters sometimes fit the absolute, the final functional need and that's a really important observation. So Ola presented that very nicely for me. Okay. So I, I, I think maybe we have to continue yes. now to the next presentation. I would first like to ask, because we have one presentation, Sam, and then the last presentation is by Elysia Main, and she's from Vancouver, which is the western part of Canada, nine, nine, nine hours time difference. I didn't see her on this. Is Elysia Main connected? She doesn't seem to be connected yet. I, I sent her an email, so I hope she will connect in the coming half hour. Mm. But I'm aware of the of the time difference. Uh, in um, it's six o'clock. It's not even six o'clock in the morning there. So I hope she will show up. Anyway, so we will go to the next presentation, uh, which is entitled "From Vertically Aligned Carbon Nanotube Production to Energy Storage." A story of startup and joint laboratory. And uh, the presentation is being presented by, uh, uh, by Martine Main from CA. And she is the research director and head of the Nanometric Structure Research Group, Lead Nights Called, with 40 people at CA in Paris Saclay. She is a long-term expertise in the field of carbon nanostructures and in particular then for the carbon nanotubes. And things that she looks at include the synthesis by catalytic CVD and growth mecha mechanism of vertically aligned carbon nanotubes, the characterization of such nanostructures with respect to morphology, size, structure, chemical composition, and she also looked at the applications in the field of energy, environment, and structured materials for, for instance, electrodes, conducting fibers, and sensors. So, please start your presentation. Thank you very much. So, I share the presentation. Um, is it now? Do you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so in this presentation, I'm going to share our experience in terms of um, startup and of joint laboratory with the, this startup and our R&D laboratory research group. So the, the work has been mainly performed in the CEA uh, with the collaboration between this, uh, our laboratory and some other universities, such as the uh, University of Sergi Pontoise and University of Tours. And um, the way we worked on that uh, was from the fundamental research to grow vertically aligned carbon nanotubes uh, to some applications that we needed to identify and to the creation of a startup and then uh, to the creation of R&D joint laboratory. So basically the context between uh, the year 2000 and 2008, it was basically a fundamental research and we worked on the growth of such structures which are vertically aligned carbon nanotubes that you can see here on the left, which is like uh, nanostructures vertically aligned, forming uh, quite macroscopic objects, which can be manipulated. 
So they can be either on substrates, such as here on the left, or they can be as powders. So they are platelets of vertically aligned carbon nanotubes. Here you can see the vertically aligned alignment. And they can be either on um, substrate and constituting different stacked layers, as you can see here on the right side in the middle, or they can grow as well on fibers here on the back uh, right side. You can see fibers which are uh, enrolled inside a vertically aligned carbon nanotubes. And we can grow up to a few millimeters high vertically aligned carbon nanotubes on substrate as shown on the right upper side. So these objects are macroscopic and processable objects. They are constituted of nanostructures, but they can be processable since they are macroscopic. So as soon as we were starting to develop this process, which is a catalytic CVD process to grow such nanotubes, we were thinking about the potentiality of such uh, structure. And basically, uh, we were uh, very motivated in their potential since these nanostructures and especially intrinsic properties of carbon nanotubes offers a very large possibility of applications. First of all, inside the nanotubes, there are porous channels. Then they exhibit nice electrical and thermal conductivity. And since they are carbon, they have a chemical nature, which can be useful for different applications regarding application which necessit necessitates low mass, for instance. So in 2002, we first deposited a patent on this uh, production process. And then after that, uh, in 2008, around this year, so eight years after, after consolidating this process, um, we were discussing with one of our colleagues, which was very uh, interested in engineering scale and scale up and in the applications. And we were starting to discuss. And this colleague with Pascal Boulanger was um, very interesting in the, in, the, in the startup creation, but also he was, um, he was uh, following MBA, uh, con uh, MBA uh, courses. And after discussing with him, we had some brainstorming with the laboratory members. So basically uh, all of my colleagues, Mathieu Pinot and Cécile Renault, And we had this uh, large uh, discussion about the applications because when we, starting, we started sorry, to uh, think about startup, we cannot avoid the applications and we cannot avoid the markets. But at the beginning, there were many, many possibilities. Nanoporous membranes exploiting the central core of nanotubes, which is uh, um, empty. Gas sensors, since, since nanotubes can absorb many, many uh, pollutants and they can change their electrical properties according to absorption. Composite materials, since Carbon nanotubes can uh, create conductivity or uh, make rein create reinforcement, mechanical reinforcements in, in matrices. So there were many, many choices. And in all this area, we were, we were, we were having already results in terms of uh, properties for these uh, applications. So at the beginning, when we were starting to to think about the startup, um, we had different uh, steps uh, to go to this creation. First, very important, the identification of a promising market. So um, we were working with the um, people specialized in a market study to identify the, the market, 
the targeted market. market. Then we, we had to go and to reach a certain maturity in terms of RRD uh, experiment. So first of all, at this time, we had only um, small samples, basically two centimeters large samples. So we were, um, we, we went to the upscaling of the synthesis process in order to get higher surface samples. And then we had to get proof of concept of device fabrication and to measure the associated properties of this device related to the commercial products which was identified by the market prospective. And in the end, it turns out that the market prospective identified um, a, a field which was around the energy storage, basically uh, supercapacitors, so supercapacitors electrodes. And it turns out that this market which was identified was, was very well combined with our first approach in terms of fundamental research uh, regarding the a new concept, which was to um, embed such aligned carbon nanotubes in polymer, in conducting polymer. So basically, this aligned carbon nanotube were used as templates to cover them with electronically conducting polymer. This polymer is uh, give a pseudo capacitive uh, energy capacitance of the system and the nanotubes gives rise to a high, a very high surface, which gives, um, uh, which gives to the polymer a high disponibility for the electrolyte. So we did a first proof of concept in 2007, 2009, between 2007 and 2009. And we study the electrical, electrical chemical conduct properties. And we ended up with some capacitance, which, was, which were very promising. And we went through uh, protection for a patent. And this was very consistent with the market study. So in the end, uh, Pascal Boulanger uh, joined the laboratory and together with the group, with the research group, we went through R&D project to improve the maturity for the industrial spin-off. So how do we make the progress in terms of maturity? First, we developed a pilot production, which is here. So it was the first pilot production, uh, the first pilot equipment for the production of basically A4, for A4 size vertically aligned carbon nanotubes. And for that, we were working together um, with the CEA and NAWA Technology. Uh, and this has been done uh, thanks to different projects that allowed us to build this uh, pilot plan and to prove that the process was ups upscalable. After that, we had this incubation phase, incubation step, uh, which consisted in uh, uh, consolidation of the technology and of the markets. So after the, the proof of concept of higher, uh, higher area uh, carbon energy production, we went to the consolidation of our technology, basically all concerning reproducibility in terms of um, production process, but also in terms of product obtained. And uh, we, we were having discussion with people specialized in the market study in order to consolidate and to identify some prospects. So this takes approximately two years. And in 2013, uh, our technology was created. Uh, Pascal Boulanger and one of his colleagues, Ludovic Eveillard, was the founders. 
and this was um, with this was followed with a license agreement which was which was signed between the partners um, and shareholders agreement as well and we went to the consolidation of the business plan and the fundraising was uh, obtained in uh, 2014. So basically uh, around seven to eight years between the first proof of concept of the, the electrodes for supercapacitors and the creation of the startup. And after that, since the, since the startup was quite young, we needed to go, to go into details about some R&D difficulties. And we founded this joint laboratory between uh, CEA uh, and Nawa Technology and the two of the partners, the two of the University of Sergi and Tour. So in 2014, and this joint laboratory, which is composed of four partners, we had a first uh, step between 2014 and 2018, so around four years, in which we were uh, performing common NRD to maturate the level of products considered by Nawa Technology. So basically, we went to the growth of carbon nanotube on the collector, on an uh, interesting collector for um, supercapacitors, the, which is aluminum. And we had to um, reach a high, high um, efficiency in the growth of low temperature synthesis since aluminum um, doesn't afford high temperature uh, such as 800 degrees. So we needed to decrease at 615 degrees the growth of carbon nanotubes to be compatible to the, with the use of aluminum, which was a quite hard job, but we succeeded. And then we improved, we, we were working on the improvement of the performances of the products. And as well in this joint laboratory, we are always in the way to search for solution and innovative concepts um, to uh, get together um, um, higher performances. So this uh, laboratory is localized on three sites, uh, CEA, CY University and uh, Tour University, all of them in France and Nawa Technology, of course. And um, it's based on the sharing of uh, people coming from Nawa Technology, CEA and the universities. As well, we are sharing equipments and uh, we have, of course, uh, uh, a contract and a specific, and a specific uh, around the agreement uh, describing the different uh, R&D activities. So in terms of impact, because when you start this, this uh, experience uh, at the beginning, when you are a researcher, you have some, uh, a lot of question and um, uh, I completely agree with uh, some of uh, the presenters um, explaining that uh, it's quite a different job between researchers and innovative developers. And I completely agree with the fact that, of course, we need to have this sort of culture in terms of innovation. But this, this uh, experience is very, very rich. And for the research group, they it has a, a very big uh, impact regarding, first of all, collaborative projects, because of course, as we go together and as, as we are doing research together, uh, we can as well join other consortia. And it's very interesting for different types of, uh, of uh, funding project. As well, this experience um, is very rich in terms of synergy because it's, um, it's quite focusing on one research field and the, and the group, the research group, the colleagues, we have all the same objectives, which is quite uh, interesting in terms of um, 
collaboration and synergy. Uh, in addition, um, this is very rich since it's open new scientific questions. And it's not only scientific questions regarding applied research, but it's also scientific questions regarding innovation and fundamental research. Um, in addition, uh, it's interesting to see how this experience can uh, improve. It can involve improvements uh, on equipments and also on characterization apparatus. And another thing is the increase of human resources, because of course, in this joint laboratory, uh, we had, we recruited uh, different non-permanent people, such as PhD and postdoc fellows, engineers, and even technicians. So the, the conclusion is what it was that, that it was uh, very rich. We have uh, deposited different patterns, uh, improvement of the know-how as well, as well a common IP, and um, technological transfer as well is one of interesting experience. And of course, we participate to, to job creation in, in, uh, through the Nawa Technology Company. So finally, today, um, um, we are still uh, in, a, in a joint laboratory, which was renewed and, uh, uh, in 2020, last year. Now we are focusing off on different medium and short-term scientific pro problematics in order to go uh, deeper in innovation, to find new concept or innovative concept, and to still support the, support the company towards commercialization. Uh, so Nawa is now in the ramp up step. So she, she's a company where it is a company working on commercialization of supercapacitors. It grows quite rapidly and they have a branch in the US at the moment. Um, and one interesting thing as well is that um, we, we, we saw that uh, the experience of young researchers in the, NAWA, in the NAWA lab, in the joint laboratory, was quite well valued in terms of professional opportunities. So it's also participate to the uh, training of people, of young people, and to their insertion in the professional field. Finally, a more personal um, contribution and, uh, and appreciation. So uh, I think, yes, it's a very nice opportunity um, because first we can contribute through the company uh, to um, solve some uh, uh, question regarding uh, societal ambitions and societal problematics. Uh, it's as, as well a great uh, experience with the colleagues involved. And uh, it's, a, it's a sort of a vision uh, which is unified and uh, which integrates the complete chains from science to commercialization. And um, it's, it allows to understand a, a lot of things in this chain. And uh, as well, one, one important thing is that um, it's, uh, it also improves the sense of human relations and human being because um, the, the approach between a laboratory, a research laboratory and a company is not often the same. And uh, of course, uh, uh, you have to understand all of that. Uh, so this is some advices that uh, personally I, I, I share with people usually when, when we discuss about this experience um, between starting with the, such a story, for instance. Um, so of course, um, you have to have some motivations uh, for uh, uh, more or less long-term commercialization objective. What is important as well is to have a vision, oops, is to have a vision of the progress of the research uh, and a, a roadmap 
it's very important. And what is also very important for a research laboratory is to keep the balance between the basic scientific question and the technological developments. Uh, one thing that it's, is um, uh, necessary to mention is that we need to pay attention to critical research points or to differentiate to differences in terms of perception of research between the lab and the company, which is uh, very important if, if the story uh, uh, wants to be successful. Uh, and uh, yes, of course, I, I, I already said it, but uh, the teamwork is very constructive in, the kind of, in this kind of project. So finally, I would just conclude that uh, it's a very motivating and, uh, and uh, a more very motivating experience. And uh, this is uh, true at different levels. And uh, yes, here I would like to thank all our collaborators in this uh, long story. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Martin, for uh, this very clear step-by-step -step, uh, procedures you have taken to bring your laboratory's research into a real startup company. It's quite impressive, even if I'm, I work 25 minutes from you. I learned a lot today. Uh, there is one question on the chat. I read that first. So the person says, you described a very well-structured approach integrating R&D and markets gradually like innovation managers in the, in the processes. And was making money ever important to you or to your colleagues? Making money, making money, is it very important for me? It's not very important for me. Making money is, was not my own principal objective. My own principal objective was to, to find and to bring um, innovative concepts to help uh, problematics in, term of, uh, in terms of society, for society, more than bringing money um, or, or, or creating money, more especially. Mm -hmm. And then I, I have a couple of questions. So I know for a fact that in your joint lab, there are still mu much of the research close to fundamental, not just applied research going on in terms of chemistry, material science and physics and whatnot. But uh, being um, part company, I imagine there is an obligation to producing a product and delivering. So how do you manage the balance between research activities and the commercial activity in the joint lab? Uh, in fact, in the joint lab, um, the commercialization is, uh, in fact, uh, when we have, in fact, the, the company is expressing his problem in terms of commercialization, okay? And this problem uh, we always express them in terms of technical problems. So we always convert together the, the commercializ commercialization problems and, and, and in order to identify the technical and scientific problem at the origin of such uh, limitation in terms of commercialization. And then we go through the upper, through the upper side of the research, through for the fundamental research, in fact. Mm -hmm. That's how we analyze this. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, the, the difficulty comes when it's, when it's um, a problem which is a short time commercialization problem. Because mm -hmm. here, of course, uh, you don't have necessary always the time to go uh, in, in deep, in deep uh, research. And uh, here you have to be uh, quite uh, flexible and to go uh, inside your know-how and the specificity of the lab. So 
that's how it goes, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I'm afraid we are running out of time. So I give it back to Kelly for the last speaker. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Martin. I have to unmute myself. Yeah, we are running out of time because we have very interesting presentations and discussions. I think it's a very good thing. We are now approach approaching uh, the end. So we have one remaining presentation. Uh, and I think it's a presentation that it will wrap things up and fit very well for that. It's presented by um, Elysia Main from S Simon Fraser University in, in, in Canada, British Columbia. The title is Accelerating Advanced My Materials Commercialization. Elysia, she is, uh, she is the uh, uh, Fandusen Professor of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Simon Fraser. University. She's also the founder of an academic director of the award-winning Invention to Innovation, which develop entrepreneurial mindset in PhD scientists and engineers, exactly what Francesco was looking for here before. And uh, she also has uh, inter interdisciplinary roots and um, which is close maybe to innovation managers that we discussed here before. She published a lot in Nature Materials, Nature Nanotechnology, Research Policy, for instance. Uh, and she's also often invited to be frequent in keynote speakers, panelists. <clears throat> and she's uh, on the board of directors for, for, it, for Foresight Clean Tech Accelerators innovate British Columbia composite knowledge networks and uh, she is also um, an active mentor to scientists entrepreneurs and she was honored as top educator in the 2021 British Columbia clean tech awards so Lisa please take the floor and uh, we are looking we are very keen to listen to your presentation Thank you very much, Kelly, and uh, a good day to everyone. It's early morning here in Vancouver, British Columbia. It's still dark outside, um, and I've had a coffee, so I sh should be uh, um, able to share my thoughts and my screen. Here's hoping. Can you see my screen uh, yet, Kelly? Yes, yes, but you have to do present presentation mode. Okay, thank you. There we go. Let me just put myself into that. Okay, how do I look? How does it look? Perfect. Great, wonderful. Well, I, I, uh, although it is early and I'm not a morning person, I did catch uh, the second half of the the immediately preceding talk and uh, wonderful presentation, Martin. And I uh, definitely see that a lot of scientists are motivated and engineers are motivated by making a positive impact in the world, and that is particularly true in novel materials discovery, that um, to make a positive impact uh, on the world with your invention, you need to be thinking about some of the innovation management and commercialization uh, strategies and frameworks um, in order to get those materials out uh, into the lab in a challenging environment. And, uh, you know, the recent report from the International Energy Agency saying that 50% of the uh, technologies that we're going to need to meet, meet our 2050 uh, climate um, net zero uh, necessity are still in labs. And there are things that we need to do now, or they're not yet discovered. And there are things that we need to do now to try to uh, transition uh, to further develop technologies and also transition them out uh, into the world. And so that's the focus uh, of and the motivation behind my talk this morning to this group about how to accelerate advanced materials commercialization. So I wanted to start by giving uh, a sense of where I come from. Uh, I am a very interdisciplinary scholar. I'm a materials engineer. Um, I have materials engineering degrees at every level of my uh, education. Um, and they're mixed with innovation management and a technology policy 
uh, degrees, along with a, an English undergrad that I did uh, at the same time as my materials engineering. So a very interdisciplinary scholar. I like to think of myself as a literate problem solver, and I owe a great deal of, uh, of gratitude uh, and, uh, um, and academic um, history and parentage to um, uh, certainly the two on the left of the screen, um, to Professor Mike Ashby and uh, to Professor Joel Clark, who were my supervisors for my master's degree and my, my PhD, uh, respectively. Uh, at the same time, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Garnsey at the top of the screen um, was uh, my interdisciplinary uh, supervisor for my uh, PhD. Um, uh, she's a, a scholar who looks at the, uh, at the growth of new technologies and who looks at technology enterprise um, uh, and a wonderful uh, qualitative researcher who complemented uh, my other um, uh, approaches to understanding the world of advanced materials commercialization. Uh, Jim Utterback on the, on the bottom of the screen there uh, looks at the emergence of new industries um, and uh, the differences between product and process innovation um, and uh, the dynamics of innovation and has been a big influence on me. Uh, and to the right, Fiona Murray um, and, uh, and Kathy Eisenhart, also innovation management scholars who, uh, who imprinted on my career. So for my PhD, I looked uh, deeply at the innovation adoption of, of new materials. This is now 20 years ago, um, more than 20 years ago, that I um, published this PhD. And uh, I was embedded within a, um, an institute, so again, interdisciplinary between the Department of Materials Engineering and the Institute for Manufacturing, which held the Center of Technology Management. Uh, I was embedded in an institute that believed in trying to get that impact out in the world uh, of the research that we were doing. And so we did workbooks that were very practical for, for industry um, and, uh, and for policymakers. And so this was the workbook we made out of my thesis called Succeeding with New Materials, a Comprehensive Guide for Accessing Market Potential. And, um, and again, this is still uh, relevant today and, uh, and available uh, freely on the internet. Uh, up until today, I'm also trying to influence industry, policymakers, and interdisciplinary academics about trying to create impact uh, from, their, uh, from their lab research. And uh, we held a symposium last year, an international symposium with uh, R&D management, uh, um, a group of practitioners and scholars who, who are very interested in how to do that through R&D management. And uh, the kind of research that I do um, is published in uh, in the innovation policy, research policy journals, innovation management journals, but it's all about, uh, the, the, the vast focus of my work is about science innovation, and in particular about advanced materials and nanomaterials innovation. So, so the talk that I'm giving to you today is, uh, is mainly based out of this paper, uh, a review paper that I did with a, a venture capitalist um, who has a PhD in advanced materials. His name is uh, Pranesh Sigopal. Uh, he's a partner with Pangea Ventures, and together, after a, a, an international conference, we, um, I wrote the academic part uh, of, of the paper, and he um, uh, challenged it and richened it with uh, case study experiences of his own 30-year uh, investment career. So the premise behind it is that it's quite a puzzle to have what many might consider a breakthrough invention, something that could be radical, um, a vast improvement in current performance attribute, maybe five to 10 times more effective in a performance attribute, perhaps an entirely new attribute that didn't exist before, um, or a substantial reduction in cost per unit. Think about being able to make something, a process much, much more cheaply, to have a radical innovation and also a generic uh, technology, so a technology like is often the case in advanced materials, which actually enables applications over several sectors of the economy, you know, perhaps biomedical, um, perhaps, uh, you know, consumer electronics, uh, sporting equipment, um, you, know, you can think of something that uh, aerospace, automotive, and yet be able to create that sort of potential value and not be attractive for commercialization. 
to, to many people, and certainly to many people in the lab, that's a thought that hasn't really crossed their mind when they're doing the research. And uh, it seems to be a no-brainer that a very important technology uh, that enables this sort of value creation would easily um, be invested in and commercialized. And yet, as the people in this workshop uh, likely know, that's not the case. And why is that? Well, in the paper that I, that I co-authored with Pranesh Siegelpal, uh, the, uh, the 30 year um, experience venture capitalist in this space, um, we agreed that the disconnect or the difference uh, that was happening with these very impactful inventions uh, was that they're in a category called science-based ventures, um, which is the, the bottom area here, the red area, um, which are very, very different um, characteristics for investment than do technology ventures. And so I'm gonna come back to this slide. I'm gonna show you the visual first. So in the visual, if you think about the attributes of uncertainty, both technology and market, and of time from the invention through to creating uh, impact or creating revenues uh, out in the marketplace, that in a science-based venture or a science-based project or a science-based business, that is a very, very different uh, challenge than it is for what is more uh, generally thought of as the technology sector. And so uh, your level of uncertainty is higher over a sustained period of time. And um, of most challenge, the amount of money and the bets that need to be made while that uncertainty is still heightened are very substantial. So in the red there, you see the commercialization costs. So different than the R&D cost, here we're thinking about uh, the pilot projects that you need to make to scale up manufacturing, uh, the, the pilot manufacturing line. We're thinking about uh, in biomedical applications, you know, clinical trials. These are very big costs while your uncertainty is still high um, and uh, they're difficult to find investment. So back to that comparison, the kind of differences are um, instead of you could think about in uh, an IT venture or let's, let's take the development of a new app that might take you six months, right? You may be able to do that, um, uh, you know, within your home, the commercialization costs are low and you're never at the, the thought that you may not be able to reach your technological objectives. There is market uncertainty. But contrast that to science-based uh, ventures, and you see a development time from invention until first potential revenues um, in product revenues, maybe 10 to 15 years. Um, uh, substantial R&D costs, but the big hurdle comes in these commercialization costs, which again, have to be incurred when technology and market uncertainty are still high. So it's a challenging space from the perspective of investors. And to add to that challenge, increasingly large corporate uh, industries are not tackling these problems from the start, like from out of the labs. They're not doing that research in their corporate research labs as they have in the past. And this is true for about the past 20 years um, uh, and, and more true in certain countries than others. But it's university spinoffs that are first taking those risks and then either being acquired by those incumbent firms or, uh, or failing. So they're the lead actors. And yet for them, uh, this financial uh, challenge is much higher uh, than it is for uh, an incumbent company. And so this, this era of open innovation, as Hank Chesper would call it, has seen uh, the multinational uh, industry players uh, rely on corporate venturing and alliance partnerships to be able to assess and monitor emerging technologies and then acquire successful ventures, which they think of as experiments. Just a little bit more about the uh, types of technological innovation that, uh, that are important and characteristic of uh, advanced materials commercialization. So for one, advanced materials is often a process innovation instead of a product innovation, or it may be both, but it, it nearly always involves process innovation. 
and uh, Jim Utterback as one of the pioneers writing about the differences um, between uh, these types of innovations and the challenges with them. Um, and the second that I'll talk in the, in the moment is that these process innovations often happen upstream in, in the industry value chains of many several sectors across the economy. So we'll talk about that second. So for process innovation here, um, this is a, a depiction of a novel uh, method of, uh, of, uh, of manufacturing hydrogen or creating hydrogen. And uh, so, you know, compared to the traditional and, and entrenched process of steam methane reforming, this is looking at, uh, you know, the, the novel method of fluidized bed methane reforming. And what's really important for a process, of course, is being able to do it at scale uh, and getting to unit production volumes that can be competitive with an incumbent process. And so here, this paper looked at, from a lab technology, um, at what annual volumes or what daily volumes um, a novel process could have a cost advantage um, and, and, of course, a huge sensitivity behind that. Uh, so in process innovation, you know, unit production cost is a hugely important factor uh, of adoption. And so anything that we can do while still in the lab, in the lab to be able to um, proactively monitor that and think about guiding experiments to try to address some of the key uh, variables of which the sensitivity analysis shows are of the most importance. And surprisingly, some of the lab research that is done and the priorities in different labs aren't necessarily aware of the variables that are the, the most uh, important or highly important to, uh, to changing viability uh, of the material. So if they were successful, that they could enable uh, a viable market application. And so uh, again, technical economic cost modeling is a method that can help you tease apart um, from the science through to uh, financial models and linking those uh, to market applications. Um, and uh, we've done a little bit of work also on fuel cell membranes, uh, looking at some of the, uh, the attributes that, that still uh, need to be improved in order to enable wider spread adoption. So here we're talking about both technical performance, the economics of production that are particularly important to, uh, to materials adoption because of the importance of process innovation. And then lastly, do, to assess viability in any kind of market application, you need to think about what will be uh, taken up, what will be found valuable by the customers or consumers in that particular market segment. And so that's where the, the third element of viability comes in, in thinking about utility assessment. And a challenge with assessing that utility yeah, it leads us back to one of the, uh, the characteristics of innovation in advanced materials, which is that they're happening from upstream positions in value chains. So actually quite far away from the end customer or consumer. What do I mean by far away? Well, a value chain, um, a stylized bio value chain, uh, moves from the initial um, pieces of the production process um, the raw materials, here are the commodities material supplier, and it moves through the various uh, industry players that um, contribute to a final product or process, which ends up with the, with the end consumer. And so you can see that often materials innovation happens what we call quite upstream in that value chain. So the commodity materials supplier would be supplying raw materials, the materials innovator would be uh, would be conducting process innovation, product innovation uh, to enhance and change that material. Um, and then they would be working in this case in, in an automotive uh, um, application, they would be working with a few levels of intermediate companies um, before they uh, work with an automotive original equipment manufacturing, you know, a, a Ford, a Daimler. Um, and then with, a, with an automotive dealer, and then with the customers. So in trying to find utility for specific technological attributes of a new material, 
it's it's uh, there's a lot of distance between the innovator and the end consumer, and a lot of, of room to get that wrong or not appreciated uh, in terms of uh, financial uh, reward. So here's an example of that challenge. So Hyperion Catalysis was a pioneer um, in, uh, in North America with, uh, multi, with uh, generating multi-wall carbon nanotubes and with mixing that uh, into a composite material uh, in such a way as to enable a whole range of, of attributes that didn't exist before. So absolutely radical innovation um, and absolutely uh, generic technology and uh, uh, based in the Boston area. And in their case, in their value chain, they, uh, they had a material supplier of nylon uh, who was um, uh, along with, uh, you know, clearly the carbon fiber uh, input that they were getting. Um, and they were, they, you know, amongst their inventions was uh, the creating of the multi-wall carbon nanotubes and then being able to, uh, um, to blend them into this reinforced polymer resin, nylon resin. They worked with uh, a tier three automotive fuel supplier. They picked as their first application after a, a lot of experimentation, a fuel line where they saw uh, utility and viability. Um, and, uh, and then they worked with an automotive supplier on the drivetrain, as well as with the OEM to, uh, to create their first uh, customer. Now, if you look at the timeline from their invention and the founding of their company through all of the different types of, of applications in different markets um, and through to, uh, and, and in red, you see the process innovation that they were doing you can note that it was 10 years from the company founding to their first product sales. And that was in a drop-in replacement application in the fuel line for which they had a cost advantage as well as a utility advantage. So even when it's being done well, uh, it's a long time process. Um, and so what I'll leave you with, and then I have lots of uh, interest in uh, in questions, and I have other examples if we uh, have time for them, is some strategies for science-based ventures. Uh, first, in being able to uh, uh, utilize innovative accelerators, if, if it is a startup venture, um, and even in the case of the large incumbent firms, being able to uh, uh, take part in some of that uh, activity that's happening at the intersection between academia and industry, uh, and sometimes also with government playing a role there. So Cyclotron Road is a great example of such a space uh, in the United States um, where uh, Berkeley National Labs uh, and, um, uh, and uh, de the Department of, of Energy had been part of uh, experiments where uh, in inventors from uh, around the US and indeed around the world come for two years as a postdoc um, to specifically de-risk uh, their technology inventions in the areas of advanced materials. And uh, it's that time that you're not supposed to be uh, focused on um, publications, but you are supposed to be focused on de-risking the, the technology and seeing uh, if it has viability in different applications that uh, can be very valuable um, to uh, enabling materials invention and innovation. And uh, some other um, examples of, of these spaces that, that can be uh, quite useful in the initial stages of, uh, of getting, uh, of, of validating viability in a new material. And then there's a, there's a key capability that uh, if we have time uh, today or maybe in the discussion tomorrow, uh, that I, I would talk about, I would emphasize is really important, is the early stage technology market matching. Because uh, an advanced materials uh, in, invention uh, and a new discovery in advanced materials, because it can enable radical uh, uh, attributes and radical advancements across many sectors of the market, the actual early stage and iterative prioritization of markets uh, and being able to uh, have the IP strategy and the, uh, the surrounding strategy to protect the potential for value creation and capture in those markets is critical to enabling a novel material to get out of the lab 
and into uh, society. And it may sound like it is exclusionary. It actually, without having that currency uh, in different markets, without having an IP, what I would call a real option uh, to, to create and capture value, um, it really interferes with, uh, you can see uh, materials advancements that stay in the lab for 30, 40, 50 years. And, um, you know, we don't have that sort of time in the climate, that's for sure. And, and the other two strategies that I would leave you with are uh, thinking about value chain positioning uh, in the markets in which you're hoping a new materials invention will be adopted and uh, partnership strategy. Alliance partnership strategy of which IP is a key consideration um, it is essential uh, to be able to get lab uh, technologies out of the market, out of the lab uh, and into the market. So I'm going to leave uh, uh, my talk there. Um, as I said, this, this, this capability of technology market matching is a real is a critical one. And I would happily um, uh, delve into that uh, more deeply, but I'm uh, I'm very aware uh, of the timing of the workshop and I want to leave time for some questions. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Alicia, for Alicia, for this very insightful presentation. And several people have messaged me uh, directly asking for your presentation. So I just wanted to say that, that your presentation is based mostly on your nature materials article that you have published a couple of years ago, is that correct? I, I've read it and uh, um, there are a few details I didn't quite understand because of the language problems, the vocabulary, I wanted to say. But so um, for those of you who asked me for the presentation, you can find many of its elements, today's presentation elements in Alicia's Nature Materials article and you will find it in a matter of second if you Google it. So now we go to the questions. There is a long question from the first speaker, Mark Kozras. Um, the auto industry deployed quality function deployment to connect the product value chain with innovation in manufacturing through the customer. Have you worked with a QFT process? And if so, does it have merit beyond select sectors like automotive? Yes, that's a great question. Um, I have done a little bit of work with QFD. It's been a while. Um, I do think it's, it's very valuable for two things, for incremental innovation, um, which is essential as you, you know, work into uh, larger scale um, products. Uh, it's very important. And it's also very useful um, if you are, you know, in a sector in which that is um, uh, an established methodology, right? So again, for automotive, uh, uh, important to speak the language of the people that you are trying to get to adopt your innovation. However, I would say that when somebody is starting out in the lab, like for example, um, uh, this is one of the examples uh, that uh, I thought might be relevant to this group. This is the Holdcroft Lab, a chemistry lab uh, at uh, Simon Fraser University here in Vancouver, um, which developed a new membrane and uh, uh, an anion exchange membrane, which was 30 times more durable in challenging ex ex uh, environments than existing materials and enabled applications in 12 different sectors. Uh, and Ben Britton on the far right side there um, came into our Invention to Innovation program at the same time there was, uh, they had uh, received, the lab had received a translational grant and they were looking at trying to prioritize which markets to address first. And, and they had 12 um, that they were looking at. Uh, and you're not gonna be able to use a tool like quality function deployment at this stage. Right? There is, there is, there's so much and varied uh, value creation and potential for value capture. And so I would say that this, the technology market matching is a whole process that precedes that. And that is really important in the formative early stages 
um, of getting a, a, a radical generic invention, um, which materials, novel materials often are, uh, out of the lab. Okay, thank you. Um, here comes the second question. Do you feel that the ec ecosystem where materials are developed strongly influences its innovation journey success rate? So that's a great question. Um, and I would say yes. Uh, the word strongly influenced is why I'm hesitating, but I would say that um, both regionally and nationally, there's a big impact of the ecosystems. And, you know, I would think of, um, of an environment uh, such as um, the type of, of industry, academic and, and small and large industry collaborations that happen in Japan, for example, um, in the advanced materials uh, sector uh, as being very beneficial to, to small innovators. Um, I think that the national innovation system and the ways that um, translational research are funded, um, you know, the, I'd say the system in Germany is very good for that as well. Um, in, in terms of a regional ecosystem, I think the most important part is having uh, a strong uh, university or universities that are well linked with industry. Um, and, you know, whereas, for example, again, in this particular um, uh, company's example, so Ionomer Innovations, uh, like many advanced materials companies, they're selling around the world. So there, there's a national component. But to get to the position where you're out of the lab and you've launched the company and you have your, uh, you have something to bring to investors, that's very regionally dependent. Okay, uh, do we still have time for more questions, Kelly? Yes, I think we can have some time for some more questions. Okay, oh, then I take advantage and I ask my question. Um, so you have speaking, uh, spoken of uh, four different uh, things we can do to accelerate the, the market strategy. Um, when you speak of early stage matching, the technology market matching, how early are you suggesting that, sh that something, as, a, as you have mentioned, most of us are upstream in innovators and we're quite far away from the end users. We don't work with people who buy refrigerators. We make one component. So um, how early should we start thinking of this uh, technology and market matching? So that's a fantastic question. And I would say you start thinking about it in the lab. Um, and at least one person in a laboratory group, so it could be a graduate student uh, who's interested in, in commercialization, but that, that should be going on as an iterative process. And again, an example here, I'm gonna go to this one. Um, you know, when Ben Britton came into uh, my Invention to Innovation uh, program and he, uh, you know, as I said, they had just won this translational grant. Stephen Holdcroft had been at the top of his field for decades, right, in fuel cell research for uh, proton exchange membranes. Um, they, and they had another big advantage on the cost side, uh, you know, in the first months when he was in the program. But at that stage, you know, they enabled a dozen applications. He put up a PowerPoint slide that had a dozen different applications that they were going to make impact on with their, with their membrane. And you can't, at that stage, there's still a ton of lab research going on. There's no way you're going to be successful in getting the translational research funds nor the investors in a dozen different applications, or if you tell them that's what it's going to enable. And you need, to, but you do need to be thinking at that stage about, um, you know, they, they prioritize three and then try to think about their experiments, their prioritizing their efforts, their alliance partnerships and their messages to investors around those uh, applications. So, uh, you know, looking at remediation of, of um, 
of industrial water uh, and, uh, and, and also chemical production, looking at energy generation and at energy storage. And you know, it turned out that energy generation and energy storage uh, became the primary uh, areas, but, but uh, sometimes it's gonna inform, again, back to those technical economic cost models, it's gonna inform experiments in the lab, Sometimes it's going to inform uh, the longer term translational grants that, that the lab applies for. Um, but without having that sort of an iterative prioritization process going on in the lab, um, there's going to be a lot of research framed and uh, research prioritized that's not going to help uh, That, that may slow down the progress of making the impact that a lab wants to make in the world. So how early is too early? Uh, I would say it's never too early. It should never be the exclusive focus of the lab, of course, but that there should always be somebody embedded in the lab that is thinking in this direction. And, uh, and also that um, we have tools. Uh, and again, I, I, I go back to that workbook that I started the presentation off with, you know, there's a lot of tools to be able to be thinking strategically about uh, viability analysis um, at, at any stage. At, you know, TRL 2, TRL 3, um, you could be thinking on, on these sort of uh, directions. Okay. okay. Uh, in meanwhile, we received another question. So the person says, you outlined the key strategies in your last slide. The general impression is that U.S., Canada seem to be more successful than you, Europe. What will be the main difference between the USA and Europe in applying these strategies? So I just missed a little piece of the question, the part about uh, who's more successful. Yes, the applying the strategies that you have described in the last page, it appears that North Americans are doing far better than the European counterpart. So what would, what would you consider, what do you see as the main difference between your culture and ours in applying these strategy that makes you North Americans more successful? So I would think that North Americans may be more successful at us uh, at certain start at the startup culture. Um, and actually I've got a, a few studies that are looking at regionally, um, you know, uh, em startups in emerging fields uh, around advanced materials. Um, but I would say that part of it is trying to uh, purposely give a lens to uh, graduate students, postdocs, uh, and faculty members that are interested uh, about um, you know this lens of saying, okay, you know you're an expert in uh, a technical area of research, but let's give you uh, enough of the language and frameworks uh, and theory to be able to. Um, do some prioritization yourself uh, in the lab and to be able to have conversations with alliance partners, uh, people that need to adopt technologies in industry and uh, investors to be able to um, uh, uh, both create opportunities, identify them, prioritize them and advocate uh, for the change that you know your technology can make. So I would say that that's a that that agency amongst those H HQP um, and and the ability to either start companies or be a bridge uh, back to university labs, uh, I think is as an advantage and perhaps a differentiating factor. So I think I, I think we we have to now, given uh, looking at the time, we have to stop. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very interesting discussion we have had here. I think we will come back to some of these points tomorrow in the panel session. But I now give the word to Holger Eason to try to summarize today's presentations and discussions. So, Holger. Thank you very much, Kalle. Um, of course, it's not easy to summarize this vast uh, information. Uh, yeah, briefly, I will try it. Okay, so we had two technical presentations, one on batteries, one on thermal electricity, two general ones uh, from uh, 
the commission, the IC, and from Alicia Main, and one uh, presentation of a startup. But the first technical uh, presentation was on uh, batteries, uh, especially on two layer electrodes. And one of the key points here indeed was uh, that uh, the, this new idea was very dependent on many parameters of the production process and how to optimize uh, the results. And um, if they are successful, of course, this is a good opportunity to bring this into the market. Um, the uh, one point which we discussed overall over the day is that researchers, at least in Europe, are not so very well connected or are not so well educated in innovation skills uh, to bring the technology forward. And um, here there is some, I mean, we have in Europe a large project called Big Map, which I can relate also to, to Mark Kodrash and, and, and Ole. It is a materials acceleration platform for batteries. And they are, have uh, 30 partners in this project. They are connected to uh, Batteries Europe with a lot of industries, with Batteries 2030, with uh, uh, all European research organizations and all together. They are the, basically, they represent the whole cloud in Europe on batteries. And also the ZSV, also, uh, Alice uh, Hoffmann, they also participate in this environment. And therefore, I think they have good chances to, to get their innovation forward in this big network. Um, then Francesco Martinucci talked about the EIC and uh, about uh, ways the commission tries to bring innovation uh, uh, forward especially uh, to shorten this 10 years uh, time frame from uh, deep tech uh, materials to the market. And uh, we gave a lot of details. Uh, key was again, what, what I said earlier, that uh, the, our researchers in Europe do not uh, so closely look into the innovation chain. And uh, again, I come back to the big map project because um, their target is indeed to uh, lower this uh, time frame of 20 years for lithium batteries to two years for future batteries. And the whole project is about speeding up the innovation. It is not about having uh, new materials uh, for batteries in two years, but having a framework which allows uh, future researchers uh, to, to, to get this innovation factor down by a factor of 10. Um, Mark discussed, uh, uh, Mark and Ole discussed thermoelectricity with materials acceleration platforms. And uh, it was a technical presentation. Key here is that uh, tox uh, to uh, toxicity and the costs needs to be uh, taken into account for a large scale up. It is not only a technology problem of uh, mixing all kinds of materials. Uh, so I, I have to say it is a simple problem in comparison or it's a, it's a simple technology in comparison to batteries. Therefore, the chances to be successful are, are also high. Uh, Martin Main Lamit discussed uh, the story uh, about the startup uh, Nava. And uh, so it's, uh, it's the same thing we had a, a couple of times today. So the startup took eight years from the first experiments to, uh, to be created and took another eight years uh, to be to have the first products in the market. And uh, it reflects again the need of a large network of researchers uh, together with companies and, and uh, people 
who are aware of bringing uh, things to the market and venture capitalism. And uh, I think then finally it was Alicia, right? I hope I did not forget somebody. <laughs> and uh, it was again a, a general presentation, but uh, I, the, the main thing I took was uh, uh, viability analysis of uh, the innovation uh, uh, surrounding, meaning uh, people should have a focus on, uh, uh, on the strategies for uh, science-based uh, 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 venture capitalism. And uh, there were four points. So the early stage technology, technology market matching analysis, utilize innovation acceleration if possible. Uh, then this was the, uh, yeah, the network. You should have a large network. And finally, you should have a focus also on the value chain. Okay, thank you, Kalle. Thank you very much. I think it was a, a good summary. Yeah, for, for me, I really, I think you, it was stressed several times here, the big difference in time, for instance, with the, with the, uh, with the uh, IT here, we're talking about the decades and also the cost of commercialization. And that makes me a little bit worried when we say we're going to solve this problem in a few decades. So we need to speed up and bring things to, to the to the to the commercialization i think we have had a very nice set of presentations very interesting discussions also uh, tomorrow we continue with the second part we have four presentations in in tomorrow but we also have the the final panel um,